the largest speedway we run on. It's the fastest speedway we run on. It's the easiest speedway we run on. It was designed and built for 200 mile an hour racing, and therefore when we're going 200 mile an hour here, it's relatively comfortable. If you uh, lose a little respect for that speed, you're going to get in a lot of trouble here. I guess you'd have to say it's a sleeping giant, and we're all giant killers, or we think we are anyway. That man is Darrell Waltrip, the only driver who has ever won the Talladega 500 twice. And the Talladega 500 is the issue of our CBS Flag to Flag coverage today. The 2.6 mile fastest racetrack in the world is about to see 40 drivers competing for some $373,000. Good afternoon, I'm Ken Squire. Welcome aboard. Our on-car cameras are all set to go. We're ready to bring you the total story, we hope, of all of the action here today in the Talladega 500. Working with me as my co-host and analyst is the two-time Grand National Champion, 50 times a winner, Ned Jarrett. And Ned, the drivers hold this track in very special respect. Yes, they do, Ken. Certainly it is the ultimate as far as a high-speed racetrack is concerned. As Darrell Waltrip said, they can run relatively comfortable at 200 miles an hour. But sometimes that will tend to sort of lull them to sleep. Because when you get out there with 40 other automobiles, the circumstances are different. You can get in trouble in a hurry. So they have to always be conscious of that. The cars that qualify at, say, 194, 195 miles an hour will be running today in draft speeds of up to 204 or 205. That's 10 miles an hour faster than they ran in qualifying. That makes a tremendous difference in the handling ability of that automobile. So it'll jump up and get them if they aren't careful. This is the race of the dark horses, where they prance. Four of the drivers who have come through here, those four drivers have never won any other races, and it is still the track where men like Cale Yarborough and Benny Parsons and David Pearson are still trying to win their very first race. The man on the pole at 201.7 miles per hour is Cale Yarborough, and standing by with him is Larry Newber. Cale Yarborough, three times a national champion, you're also number three on the list of winners of all time in NASCAR, but this particular race has eluded you. How does Cal Yarbrough view that? Is it important to you? Well, it is important. You know, uh, I've been lucky enough uh, to win most every race that we've ever run, and uh, even though I've won here, I haven't won this particular race, but I hope today we're going to put a stop to that. You know, something else, Cal. Last week when the rest of the division was up in Pennsylvania racing, you guys were here practicing. You're taking this one pretty serious, aren't you? Well, I'm serious about it. Uh, it's time I win this race, and... Uh, so we came down and, and did some practice, and I hope it pays off for us. And the race cam. That 22-pound gadget has not at all hindered you, has it? Well, it hasn't hindered me a bit. Uh, I've won three out of four times with it, so I welcome it back. Ken, he starts from the best place in the world, number one. Our CBS camera on board, Cale Yarborough's car. The fates of Teledorigo work in strange and mysterious ways. The man on the outside of the front row has our second onboard camera, and he is one of the dark horses. He's never won a race, and Mike Joy is standing by with him at this moment. Ken, many of these race cars were built in large factories with crews and teams of 30 to 40 men and tested at factory wind tunnels. Not this one. This car was built in a little garage in Dawsonville, Georgia, by Bill Elliott and his brothers and his dad and a couple of friends to help out. As he's strapped into this car and gets ready to go here at Talladega. Who helped put this car on the pole? Well, I feel like all the guys back at the shop worked very hard, and, you know, we're just a, a small family-run operation, but, you know, we worked hard and accomplished quite a lot. Are you surprised to have qualified not only all the other Fords, but all but one other car here? Well, I really am, because we didn't expect to run as good as what we really did, and you know, we worked hard and just did the best we could, and here we are. Three Fords on the outside row in the front three positions. Can you three link up in a draft against the Chevrolets, or will you have to try to tuck in on the start? Well, I still feel like Kale's the car to beat, and when the flag falls, we'll just have to see what we can do and what we can't do. Back upstairs to Ken Squire. The ceremonies are underway to commence the Talladega 500. Stand by for our live flag-to-flag -flag coverage here on CBS. 
This CBS Sports Special is sponsored by Pontiac, who invites you to test drive a new Pontiac at your Pontiac dealer. At Pontiac, we build excitement. Michelob Light, an exceptional light beer with a rich, smooth taste. And by Union Oil, the winning spirit rides with you every time. It's the spirit of 76. Call him the king because Richard Petty knows what it takes to win. Going into the last lap, there's no better place to be than in second. Then, if you slingshot at just the right moment, you could be the winner. Winning. It's a part of men like Richard Petty. And that winning spirit has helped Union 76 few more winners than anyone else. That winning quality rides with you every time you ride out of a Union 76 station. Go with the spirit. The winning spirit. Spirit of 76. Now, let's meet the starting grid for the 15th annual Talladega 500. On the pole, the Talladega 500 still seeking his first win, qualifying at 201.7 miles per hour in his Chevrolet Cayley Arborough, and beside him, the dark horse in the Ford, Bill Elliott. Row two, Benny Parsons, developing North Carolina, in a Chevrolet, Dale Earnhardt in his Ford, outside. Row three, 73 champion Richard Brooks and the 75 winner Buddy Baker. Row four from Texas, Terry Labonte. From Indiana comes Clark Martin. Row five, Jeff Bodine and the two-time winner of this event, Darrell Waltrip. In row six, Mississippi's Lake Speed and the 1974 winner, Richard Petty. Row seven, Kyle Petty and the 1980 winner, Neil Bonnet. Row eight, David Pearson of Spartanburg, South Carolina, and Grant Adcox is back. Row nine, Ricky Rudd of Chesapeake, Virginia, and last week's winner at Pocono, Tim Richmond. In row 10, the 1981 winner, Ron Bouchard and Jody Ridley. And here is the rest of the starting field for this Talladega 500. Joe Rutland and Sterling Marlin in row 11. Then comes the band of Harry Gant in row 12 alongside Bobby Allison, who's won here before. In row 13 is Buddy Arrington in a Chrysler and Trevor Boyd in the James Hilton car. Row 14, Illinois' Bobby Wolak and Cecil Gordon. In row 15 is Ken Reagan and Billy Harvey. Row 16, Bobby Hillen out of Oklahoma and Morgan Shepard. In row 17 will come Al Almore making his first super speedway appearance in Tommy Gale. Then it's Mike Potter and Dave Marcus who won here in 1976. It's Ronnie Thomas and J.D. McDuffie for row 19, and Dr. Dick Skillen and Travis Tiller round out our starting field back in the 39th and 40th positions. So now we're getting down to it. Those last moments are being counted off, Ned, before we begin this great race. Well, of course, uh, there's a lot of anticipation by a lot of people here today, Ken. There are a lot of drivers in the field who feel that they're very capable, and this is one race that they can come to that they feel maybe their chances are a little better than at other races. Bobby Allison is back there in the 24th position. A bit of a surprise, and standing by with him is Larry Newbert. Bobby, it seems like every Grand National race, one of the front runners ends up starting at least in midfield, and uh, you drew the short straw today. How does Bobby Allison view this starting position back in the 12th row? Well, I'd really rather be a little closer to the front, but uh, here at Talladega especially, it's, uh, I don't think, a real major factor. Uh, just our qualifying effort wasn't good enough this trip, and uh, so we're back here. The competition uh, won't let you slip up any at all. Obviously, the key, Bobby, is to keep the leaders within sight, or at least earshot. Now, how are you going to know exactly where the leaders are in the early stages of the race? Well, Gary keeps up with all that. Uh, he lets me know from the pits uh, what the deal is. And really, uh, in a 500-mile race, uh, we can let things settle down a little bit before we have to really be uh, concerned with that. We do know that Kale's capable of going very fast, and uh, so that might be a factor. But uh, all in all, we just uh, try to run a good hard race all day long and uh, kind of let things settle down. So far, 1983 has been his year. He comes in as the points leader, Ken Squire. Third of the all-time win list, the 1971 winner of the Talladega 500. Live pictures from Bobby Allison's car down there on Pitt Road. There are a lot of great champions here, and there are some drivers who are making their first try. One of them is 24 years old. He lives about 17 miles from where Cale Yarborough hails. 
and he hopes to someday have his name recognized like a Yarborough. But for today, he's an unknown. His name is Al Elmore, and Mike Joy is there. Ken, probably every man watching at home would like to be in this Talladega 500 kind of vicariously, and one of the every men that is is Al Elmore. Why would a fellow who's running in only his fourth asphalt race ever want to run here on the fastest speedway on earth? Well, we had a chance. Uh, we got a good sponsor and all, and DK Ulrich and the crew have really done a good job on the car this week, and uh, we're just here. Uh, we made the field, and that's something to you know, be proud of, and we hope to have a good finish here. You've raced twice at Nashville, once at Pocono, 150 mile an hour track. What's the biggest difference about going 200 miles an hour? Well, to me, the biggest difference is the straightaway speed isn't that much, but when you hit these turns at 200 miles an hour, it's really tough. It's really a different ball game. Good luck today. Thank you, Mike. The field firing. 40 cars strong, ready to go for it. We've had so many great races here at Talladega, Ned, and I anticipate this is going to be another barn burner. I don't think there's any question about it, Jim. Everybody is very high, when I say everybody, I think at least half of this field, the drivers feel that they have a shot at winning this thing. And of course, that's what creates and makes competition. You're inside Cale Yarborough's car number 28. If you were with us at Daytona, you rode with him to victory. If you were with us at Michigan, you rode with him to victory again. The question is, will the string continue for Cale Yarborough? There's Bobby Hillen, young driver, just cutting his teeth in Grand National Racing, hoping for a great race today. This fellow just graduated from high school back in May, Ken, so there's a lot of young fellows around the country who would like to be in his position. Some of the 100,000 that are gathered here on this 2.6-mile track, waiting as the suspense builds, and this is always a suspenseful race. It certainly is as they get ready to roll them off the line, knowing that in just moments that they'll be accelerating up to 200 miles an hour. There have been 10 winners already on the Grand National Circuit this year. There are at least another 8 or 10 in this field today who are capable but haven't won so far. And 10 winners is a modern-day record in Grand National Racing. You have to go back to the days when you were out there chomping at the bit and had to find that there were 14 or 15. And, of course, we were running many more races on the season than they run now. We were running up to 50 to 60 races, and it was easier, I guess, because of the fact you were running more races. Car in trouble on pit road. One lane has come to a stop momentarily. The hood is up on one automobile, and now some other cars moving around. Number 20 is the uh, automobile in trouble down on pit road. Number 29, and that would be Grant Adcock's car having a problem. Grant had a back. very good call. Yeah. near-perfect weather conditions for racing at Talladega. The Grant Adcock car in trouble on pit road has fired and has joined the field. The cars are now through the tri-oval area down to the start line. We're in one lap. They will be racing. You are inside Cale Yarborough's car number 28. Cale, how do you feel about this one? This is Ken Squire in the CBS Control. Well, again, how do you feel about today's race? Well, I feel real good, Ken. Uh, the car has been running real well for us all week, but you know, the competition is very keen here. It's uh, going to be 20, 25 cars that's going to run. Have you, changed, have you changed engines since qualifying? Yes, I have. This is a fresh engine, but we just hope it's as good as the one we qualified with. Thank you, Kale. Let's go to Bill Elliott, who is in car number nine on the outside of the front row. Bill Elliott, Ken Squire at CBS. Do you read it? Roger, loud, clear. Okay, who's going to lead the uh, first lap? Are you set to pull that one off? Well, I hope so. We'll have to see how we do when the race starts. Bill, this is Ned Jarrett. How about the acceleration of the Chevrolet of Cale Yarborough as compared to your Ford? Well, I feel like he could probably beat me on the start, but we'll just kind of take it as it goes. I feel like he's going to be the car to outrun all day anyway. Is the car all right? Any problems at all since you qualified? Not any problems whatsoever. Well, good luck to you and the family from up in Dahlonega, Georgia. Hope you have a good day. Thank you very much. Field coming around to turn three. Notice the gum on the dash. This is a six-gum straight, 500 miles. Uh, they take a stick every 100 miles, as I understand. All right, Kelly Yarborough is leading the field down out of turn number four. The pace car about to come in. You're going to get the jump on him, Kale, as you come to the line. concentration right now not wanting to over rev that engine on the reason on the start of this race but also wanting to rev it high enough that he might be able to pull away and get
get a car lane lead to go into turn one, it's going to be interesting. And they told him, he said he wanted to bring us right down to the flag, but today he is all focused on one thing, the green flag, and trying to get a break. And here come a lot of cars that pick up on that draft if he indeed does have two miles an hour over the rest of the field, which I would doubt with an engine change. As they go into turn number one, up on that 35 degree banking for the first time on this 2.6 mile track. Kale jumps out in front, and you're looking at the back as Harry Dent and Harry Parsons begin to make their move. Parsons is pulling up into second place. Gant getting trapped to the wall and then getting back in again. Sort of as expected, Elliott fell back at the beginning. Terry Labonte, who started in seventh position, all the drivers felt he was one of the cars to outrun here, has already moved up to third place. Terry Labonte in the third position on the start. Labonte has been running very strong yesterday in practice. He started seventh. Well, Ken, I made a prediction yesterday that Kale would not lead this first lap. Let's see. Here's Benny Parsons trying to move on the inside. Parsons down low as they come to the tri-oval. As they come to the line, it is even. I think Parsons took it by just about three inches. Scarborough back in front at turn one. And dragging with him, Terry Labonte on the outside in the second. And over 200 miles per hour. That is Kale Yarborough's camera. If you look out the back of his car at Terry Labonte, who has been getting stronger and closer to a successful day. Never won this race. Here's Labonte going for first place in the back straightaway. Terry Labonte at over 200 miles an hour in the first. He seemed to do it with almost ease. Of course, the fact that he could move by that quickly, he picked up the draft to tail Yarber and just moved right around. They are in turn three. Earnhardt has moved the third spot. A car spinning at the bottom. It is Dale Labonte in 75 and another car hammers the wall. Cars slowing, trying to get away. One car head on to the wall. Terrible crash at the beginning. The front of the field is coming across. Car number 76. Potter ends up down in there. There are at least four or five cars involved. Neil Bonnet's car breaking away at the top of turn three. That is Neil Bonnet out of car number 75. Bonnet was on the low side of the racetrack, Ken. It looked like he broke traction as he started off the turn. There's car number 78, Richard Skillen, Dr. Skillen, is uh, against the outside wall. And here is Dave Marcus, car number 71. He was also involved. And that looks like... That is Grant Edcock. Grant, who had the trouble on the uh, starting line. Yes, Edcock. he did. He did get the car to going. Incidentally, his that dad... That really hurt. Yes, it is. But Grant looks like he's okay. His dad is president of the Chamber of Commerce in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Short day here for Grant. He's not going to be able to give Chattanooga much exposure. Front today. end gone. Back end gone. They want an ambulance for Grant Edcock as he extricates himself from car number 29. He's been five years away from the races. Back here today making a return to the High Street Wars this weekend at Talladega, a track that has dealt him more than his share of despair. Dr. Skillen, who cut his teeth up on the Claremont Speedway in New Hampshire, walking away from car number 78 in the second lap. Trouble out of turn four. There you see the 64 car of Tommy Gale on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. to have another look at it and Ed Jarrett will have an opportunity to let's see if we can find out exactly there. Well, there you see 75 low we need to look at that again to see if anything was near him or if he's just down on the bottom. He almost looked as if he was trying to get down off of the banking of the turn again because he was so far down below the other cars. Of course once he made his slide other cars not knowing what he might be going to do which way the car was going they started uh, making maneuvers and you don't make much of a maneuver at 200 miles an hour the car will get away as we saw it here several cars as you can see getting into this mammoth crash here on the second lap at these speeds when something goes wrong with one you can see that it can affect many many others there's the car number 74, the yellow car of Bobby Walwack, who now makes his home in Midland, North Carolina. He's formerly from Villa Park, Illinois. That's, uh, I believe, Grant Adcock who was on the ground. He has had some terrible misfortune on it, and that's Dr. Skillen, the driver beside him, showing some frustration and despair. In the early going, we have a five-car wreck in turn four of the Alabama International Motor Speedway. You're watching live pictures here as they are administering to Grant Adcock. That's so, Tommy Gale that we're seeing with his back to us. All the drivers are always concerned about their fellow man out there. Grant, Grant Adcock has bad memories of 
other races here. Back in the 75 race, Cotton Lovell, a mechanic for him for many years, died of a heart attack while they were just going through a routine checkup out here on Pit Road. And that was the, this is, was to be his first Grand National race since 1979 on this course. That is Grant Adcox. Of course, we're happy, Ken, that we did see him get out of the car himself. Uh, and then, of course, the safety crews were called over to him. I'm sure that uh, the lick that he took, his car was damaged very badly. Uh, they want to take him to the track hospital for observation. Let's take a tighter look at what happened out there. We won't see the whole thing, but we will see, I believe, as they're taking Grant Adcox to the safety center here. Okay, here are the leaders now as they come off of the fourth turn, and here's Bonnie down on the inside. He was all the way down on the flat part of the apron. You see a car back in the back getting loose as a result, trying to make a maneuver when he saw Bonnie's car get loose. Bonnie trying to save the car. You can see he has the wheels cut to the right, but the momentum is just carrying the rear end right on around as he approaches the inside retaining wall. The number 75, the Warner Hodgson car, it started in 14th position. There's Dave Marcus's car. They're looking at the front end on that. The 1976 winner of this event. Marcus is up pretty good in the point standing, so he wants to try to get it back in there as much as he possibly can. A quick report from Mike Joy. They're working on the left side of Dave Marcus's car. You can see the sheet metal damage, the bent rim, and left side tire. They had a quick look under the hood, but we'll close it. It looks as if if there's no left front suspension damage, they can get Dave Marcus back into the race without losing another lap. Marcus, the only driver who ever won this race from the pole. Let's go to Larry Newber. Rick Castleberry is one of the crewmen on Grant Adcock's car. You've heard from Grant down at the crash scene, have you not? Right, Grant's all right. He just uh, got a little trouble there. We're just out for the day. You guys did not have an opportunity to ask Grant exactly what did happen as he saw from his seat? No, the car, somebody spun, and just everything broke loose from there. Grant Adcox driving the car that Cale Yarborough went so fast in at Daytona earlier this year out of the race. Four of the 188 laps complete here in the Talladega 500. First caution of the day comes early for a five-car crash. Back with more of our live coverage of the Talladega 500 in a moment. Following the Talladega 500 today, stay tuned for the final round of the Canadian Open from Oakville, Ontario, Canada. That's coming up next today here on CBS Sports, and they have a rookie from Kentucky leading the Canadian Open as they finished yesterday after Fuzzy Zeller had led the first day. Landrum of Kentucky trying to pull it out. Tom Pertzer in second, and California's young John Cook stays right there, also a stroke off the lead. Now, as we get ready for a restart probably five laps away, Cale Yarborough stays out there behind the pace car at this time. Let's take another look from inside Yarborough's car, driving through the wreck scene. See, Dale Earnhardt is pulled up there. Just take a look at the debris left after the mayhem in turn four. A lot of debris scattered all over the racetrack as a result of those cars, five cars, crashing, spinning all over the track. And this is something that the drivers are very conscious about and want to be very careful not to hit any of them because these tires are very easily cut. Let's go to Mike Joy with Neil Bonnet. Neil Bonnet's car triggered the caution. Neil, what happened? Mike, as I was going in the third turn, I started down under some of the traffic at full speed and something went little turn loose in the motor. The thing just completely exploded dropped all the oil on the racetrack and my car got sideways in the oil and you know luckily enough I didn't hit anything but there's some of the cars really torn up out there 200 miles an hour oil all over those slick tires not a whole lot you can do but hang on is there well I got it cranked around a couple of times and got it headed back in the right direction but you're, you're somebody else's mercy when that thing starts at let's go back upstairs well, that's a misfortune for the Warner Hodgson crew. Rookies at 200 miles an hour. That's a story, and CBS took a look at it. Here's a report filed by Ned Jerry. It's not easy being a rookie on the NASCAR circuit. Over the last three years, only one has visited Victory Lane, and that was Ron Bouchard right here at Talladega. Now, to the outside goes Labonte. comes up the inside. Three cars side by side. Ron Bouchard has won in a photo finish. For the most part, rookies are student drivers, trying to earn a living and learn a profession at the same time. They must be careful because they know one small mistake can cost them their ride, their season, and even their career. 
Every rookie in today's race carries an extra piece of equipment. To have a yellow strip of tape on the rear bumper, this lets the veteran drivers know that they are approaching a first-year driver and that they should approach them with extra caution. This is a small part of the rookie program that was developed by competition director Dick Beatty. Our goal is to have a rookie program to start a super speedway race and to end the super speedway race without having a crash or being involved in a crash. And I feel that with the veteran drivers giving their expertise about the different tracks that our goal is being accomplished. Yes, some foreign matter on the racetrack or the wreck. The NASCAR program includes classroom instruction at most of the speedways on the circuit. The old pros, Richard Petty, Bobby Allison, Harry Gant and Daryl Waltrip teach the new drivers how to race. You got a problem with that race car? For God's sake, come back in the pit. You're not on a half mile racetrack. An oil leak ain't going to go away. Smoke ain't going to go away. In one turn here, you can blow a tire. So if you got something wrong with that race car, don't think you're going to figure it out and then come in. Come in and let that crew work on that car. Pay attention to that. Make sure that that you don't. Leave the pits with something wrong with that car. Don't get in a big hurry and leave, and one guy's got his wheel tight and the other guy doesn't. Those are some good driving pits. I mean, don't let them go lightly, because they can save your life, and they can save our lives, too. The instruction isn't taken lightly. The rookies know it's better to learn the easy way in the classroom than the hard way on the track. As a rookie in, in NASCAR racing, there's just so many things that we don't know about the cars. And that just gives us one more opportunity to sit down and talk with some of the, the old-time veterans that, that really know all of the things that one day we'll have to know to be successful. You really learn a lot, being, you know, that we haven't been to the speedways before, and, you know, the guys like Richard and Daryl and Harry, you know, they do know their way around, and they tell you things that you don't know at first, but it registers on the racetrack, and, you know, you, it you know, really helps keep out of trouble. Safety and improved driving skills are not the only benefits from this education program. There are monetary awards for the top finishing rookie in each of the races, and then at season's end, there's $10,000 that goes to the rookie of the year. But there's one thing about it. When you come out of turn number two for the first time at over 204 miles an hour and it tweaks slight right, words can't describe what's going to happen, right? Yeah. That's exactly right, Ken. But they do uh, plant a lot of these things in their mind, and, you know, you act on instinct many times uh, when you're running out there at 200 miles an hour. So if they got the right thing in their mind, uh, then the right thing maybe will come out. Seven cars have been retired by the wreck that is still being cleaned up at turn number four. CBS Sports live coverage of the Talladega 500 will continue after this word from your local station. With eight laps complete, 21 miles, there are the standings. Not many are taking the opportunity to come in. Terry Labonte is grabbed first, Earnhardt is second, Bill Elliott is relegated back to the fifth position at the present time. And here's the attrition from that crash early in the going. And you can add another name to it. A seventh name is the Harvey car. Number 31 has also retired. Let's go quickly to Mike Joy. They're working on Tim Richmond, but not the race car. Although these drivers wear goggles, Tim got a piece of debris in his eye. They're trying to work it out. Car owner Raymond Beadle is here. Raymond, if that continues to irritate him, what will you do? Well, we've already talked to Neil Bonnet. We're going to put Neil in the car if, if it doesn't work out. We tried to rinse it out and deaden his eye just now, so hopefully it'll be okay. It'll take a few laps to see whether or not the solution has done its job and cleared up that eye irritation problem. Ken? That's the uh, third pit stop he's made for that problem. Lap four, seven, and now eight minutes. And I'll tell you, running at 200 miles an hour, you wanted all of your vision available to you. And there's the vision out of car number 28, complete with a butterfly there floating along. <laughs> More like floating along on a 3,700-pound elephant. Cale Yarborough in third place. These cars so heavy. Cale. Cale Yarborough. Kelly Arborough, Ken Squire, and the CBS, do you read us? Go ahead, Ken. Okay. Got through that one. It was a big scrape behind you on that. What did you think when you came around and found that six cars had got tangled coming out of turn three? Well, I didn't see exactly what happened, Ken. I know it was a mess when I came back around. 
Only concern I have now is the debris we ran through from the wreck. We just thought that uh, it hadn't damaged our tires in any way. And we're going to go from here. If the two guys in front of me did before the green comes out, I'm going to stop too. But if not, we're going to go on. That was just the question we were going to ask. You are not going to pit then unless they come in. Right. I'm not going to pit unless they do. That's the story from Kelly Arborough. It's, it's got to be a little chancy out there running through all that debris net. Yes, it is, Ken. It certainly is a big concern of every driver. We'll be back with more of our live CBS flag to flag coverage of the Talladega 500 after this message. Most guys spend Sunday taking it easy. Not me. When I'm racing the Bandit, there's no taking it easy. So I'm out here early before a race trying to relax. Just me and my scope. Just a pinch gives me real tobacco pleasure without lighting up. And that winter green flavor's a real winner. Go smokeless with Skoll or Copenhagen. A pinch is all it takes. We may have a driver change taking place. Let's go right down to car number 27. Tim Richmond's eye is scratched. He is climbing out of the car. And Neil Bonnet, whose blown engine triggered the first caution of the day, is climbing into the Pontiac number 27, the Raymond Beetle car. The car Bonnet has not driven before, but since he did practice for the race and compete, he is an eligible replacement driver. Emergency medical technicians right now are trying to flush the debris from Richmond's eye. Then he'll go for treatment. We'll see if we can get a word from him while he's still here. It takes a little while, Ken, to hook up the safety paraphernalia as well as the radio equipment. They look like they have it all about hooked up now, so Bonnie, he's about the same size, not quite as small as Tim Richmond, but he should fit in that seat pretty well. Neil was telling us just yesterday that those seat belts, you can tighten them up as much as you want as they're working on Tim Richmond here on his eye. He said that no matter how much you tighten them up, First time you get out of the corner and come out, they just loosen up almost so you can slap your body back and forth about an inch or inch and a half as the lower part of your back compresses from the tremendous g-force as you take on the banking here. Well, okay. that's terrible news for Tim Richmond. Check his side. Tim Richmond, who won at Pocono just a week ago in the 500-mile race on that two-and-a-half-mile track at Pocono, Pennsylvania, in one of the best races of the year. He fought to get it up into the front, and he had to fight his way back twice before he finally succeeded in winning that race that was stopped by rain twice. And now here today, he really was optimistic that he was going to make it two in a row. He was very optimistic, Ken, and I predict that we'll see him back in that race car later on this afternoon. Here's Grant Ashcock's car. They had to literally haul it in on the truck. Let's take another look at what brought around this caution, the first one of the day. There's the 75 car, which has lost an engine, bottom of your screen, center, sliding out of control. And he, he did a good job of gathering it up, but it starts to move up, and some people behind him who probably have room to get through, Ned, wondered considered that perhaps they weren't going to get that chance and they took that kind of evasive action that started the chain of incidents that has had eight cars involved five of them now out of the race and this car that we saw slide up and hit the wall i suspect he hit the oil that caused neil bonnie to spin around when the engine let go on his car so that put him out of control and he slid up across the track in front of other cars they were trying to break maneuver around others in front of them losing control and we see the end result now repeating the cars out are Neil Bonnet, Dr. Richard Skillen, Tommy Gale, the Travis Tiller, car number 46 has been retired, Grant Adcock took heavy abuse, and the Harvey car number 31. Those six cars are out. One car has come back on the track, Bobby Wowak, number 74, has returned to it, and they have black flagged that car since. And there's the end of car number 29. And, of course, we saw some damage on Dave Parker's car. They were continuing to work on it, and I believe he has gotten back in the, uh, the field as well. We are now in the 12th lap. We are in the 12th lap. They are working 12. There you see the standings as of 11 complete. And nothing changing. Notice, too, that those front five, none of them has ever won this Talladega 500. You have to go back to the sixth position before you find a previous winner in this 15th annual, that being Richard Brooks, the man who won here and won his only Grand National race here in 1973. He feels today is uh, perhaps his
his best chance of winning this race since he won that one back in 1976. Yeah, that was a really working strange story the year he won that race. He came here without a ride and he left without a ride. He came here and picked up a ride of the Crawford brothers, took the car to victory. Before the race was over, they sold the car to someone else. And by the time he pulled into victory lane, he was back with his thumb out. Normally, if you win a race of this stature, that will set your career up for the future. But it just didn't happen in that case. Here's Ron Bouchard, a former winner here. When he was a rookie driver on the circuit, getting a change of tires, I believe before we see the green flag wave again that we'll see others coming in. They still want to take that chance of that tire going down. They can't tell when they're riding around out there slow because of the interliner tires that they use on these cars. If the tire is a little bit low, maybe it was cut and running through some of the debris. See, he's changing all four tires on that car as a precautionary measure. Certainly they haven't used, haven't worn the tires that bad now. There's a windshield being repaired some of that for sure before the afternoon is over. There's a tremendous amount of pressure on the windshield here at the high speeds that they run, and just a little bit of a nick in the windshield, maybe a, a piece of debris from another track or a gravel or something flies and, and crack the windshield a little bit. That's Jody Ridley in car number 84. Then uh, as the pressure goes against it, it can cause it to crack, and we have actually seen the windshield cave in, and that's why they have those three strips of metal on the center of the windshield to help uh, avoid that pressure. Here's Mike Joy. Ned, actually, that's their second windshield today. The first one got a piece of debris in it from the Neil Bonnet wreck. They put in this new one and running around under caution. It, too, has developed a problem, so they're getting it securely taped in and trying to send the 1980 Rookie of the Year back on his way. Jody Ridley, who formerly drove car number, eight, is yeah. number 90, the car that Richard Brooks now has control of. Dave Marcus has just come in, gone back on the track another time. Marcus, number... 71, and you see the Ridley car also back out on the track as we prepare for a restart with 12 laps complete, one more lap, and they'll turn them loose. Bobby Wolak's car has now been retired. Consultation flag out, and they have put that car back to the garage, so seven cars have retired from that initial incident here in the Talladega 500, 2.6-mile track, live CBS coverage. Kale, no one came in, Kale Yarbrough, 10 Squire. No one came in in that period. And now do you think it's a little chancy when you go back to full speed? Well, it's going to be a little chance again, but uh, we're going to start single five. We've got one to go here now. If you made a stop now, you would end up about a mile back. So we're going to stay right where we are. Just hope everything's, uh, no cars were cut for anybody. Kale, this is Ned. How's your car handling those first couple of laps that you ran under green? Uh, Ned, the car's handling uh, real good so far. Of course, we haven't ruled enough yet to really tell, but I think uh, I think it's going to be all okay. Got a pretty couple of strong horses in front of you there. Yeah, these boys are running real strong. Uh, we're just going to take a look at them and see what it looks like. Setting for a start, back in fifth position is Bill Elliott. In sixth, Richard Brooks. In seventh, Buddy Baker. Eighth is Mark Martin. Ninth is Benny Parsons. Tenth is Lake Speed. Eleventh is Petty. Twelfth is Waltrip. Thirteenth is Ricky Rudd. And fourteenth is Joe Rutman as we prepare for the green to come out. Hardly had they dropped the green on the command to fire the engines by Bob O'Deer. And we are under caution here. And it's been a lengthy one thus far. Lap three to 14 will go down as caution laps in this 15th annual Talladega 500. And those caution laps extremely costly to seven cars which have retired. That three drivers lead thus far. Yarborough jumps out briefly, then Parsons, then Labonte. Ken, no big surprise that Terry Labonte has come to the front. In the late practice runs here yesterday afternoon, he and Dale Earnhardt, who is running in second place there in the Ford, hooked up together and drafted at over 204 miles an hour. So it looks like the Chevrolet and the Ford are two good combinations of drafting. And I suspect once we get to going again, which we're about to do, that we'll see some laps well over 200 miles an hour. 14 laps, 37 miles about to be completed as Harold Kinder unfurls the green. And you're watching Kaylee Arborough as he goes after Terry Labonte in front, Dale Earnhardt in second. The field attacking turn one. Immediately, those front two cars begin to draw away. That number 44 car, that is the Terry Labonte car, locking up in a draft with the Ford of Dale Earnhardt and trying to get some distance right off the flat. This is the combination that seemed to work so well. Earnhardt running second and Labonte first, and they're able to pull away a little bit. We have a report that there's still a lot of oil down over there in turn three and four area. That was Bobby Allison's report to his crew chief, and there is Allison skirting, scooting up the outside, going around Richard Brooks, pulling up on Morgan Shepard. Allison in the white
white red numeral number 22. Remember, he started 24th. He's already on the attack. Rushing through traffic. Trying to win his second Talladega 500 leaders. Labonte, Earnhardt, and Buddy Bird, Kaylee Arborough. Well, it didn't take the Arborough too long to catch back up once he picked up the draft with those two cars. He has a super fast engine. That engine produces as much horsepower as anyone else in the field as indicated by the fact that he qualified at over 201 miles an hour. A two-second interval back to fourth place, which is at the moment Bodine. Now, how would you like to be the meat in that sandwich sitting there between those cars running over 200 miles an hour? They switch them around again. There's Elliott moving up behind number 21, Baker. And number 88, Bodine, dropping back. Bodine falling from fourth back to the sixth position now. He had led that battle going down the back straightaway. He finds himself now in sixth up to seventh, Bruce Petty. car 
draft up in front with number three, Ricky Rudd, on the tail end of it. In front again is Cale Yarbrough looking back at the second place car, Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt in that second position. The fastest track over which the Grand National Cars and NASCAR participate. And here goes Earnhardt another time to lead. Baker coming with him. Back on the inside. <laughs> back on the inside, and it's again. Well, Earnhardt Baker was about to get a little loose there. Baker made that tremendous charge to come up. Here they come for the tri-oval. Very loose part of the racetrack now. Yes, it is. They say this is the toughest part of the racetrack to drive. It uh, can be a little bit deceiving. You are really running a mess there as you run anywhere on the racetrack. And the fact that you make a turn, not bank pilot steeply as it is, in the one, two, three, and four. The leaders going down through there just put a lap on Al Elmore, the 24-year-old driver making his first run, running in a green car by like D.K. Ulrich on the bottom of the track. Now that fourth car is Terry Labonte, number 44, as Baker goes to the lead another time. Buddy Baker out of Charlotte, North Carolina. 6'4 Giant. Wow, down through, and here comes Labonte with him. Behind Yarborough now. Labonte pulling up, taking some drafts along into third spot. Earnhardt back to fourth. That fifth spot is Elliott. But Labonte got sort of hung on the inside there as he pulled out, and he didn't have the momentum to go past Dale Earnhardt, so he left him what they call hanging out to dry, so he had to drop back in the fourth position. In fact, he dropped back to fifth. Now it's Bill Elliott moves around. Right, back to fifth goes, car number 44, Terry Labonte. In the sixth spot is Bodine, up to seventh, who's late speed, up to eighth comes Waldrop. Burst it open to win. You have a little bit of back and right there. They get right in that draft and just shoot right past them. It looks like they poured 100 horsepower into the engine, but that's not really what happened. They just picked up the draft. The next car can do it as easily as when he takes the notion to pass as Earnhardt. Looks like he wants to do on the outside. Most of them have been passing on the inside. Earnhardt uh, decides that's not the thing to do so. All of this at over 200 miles an hour. 24 laps complete, 164 to go. Here's a report from the Bobby Allison pit. Larry Newman. And Bobby's crew chief, obviously somebody we're going to watch all day moving up in the middle of the pack. One of the last conversations, Gary, that Bobby had before he got behind the wheel was with Neil Bonnet. Are you guys aware that Neil is in Richmond's car? Oh, yes. We told Bobby that Neil's driving the 27 car now. Uh, they're kind of, they're running the same pace as the leaders right now, but there's so much dicing around going on that, that we're just going to kind of sit where we are and uh, hope nobody gets away from us. We're, uh, the car's not working perfectly yet. We've got to do a little work on it. They're drafting together. I had the feeling that that was a thought that they had before the race started. But, of course, Neil was going to be in a 75 car. But apparently it's still working, even though the cars are different. Well, I, I don't know if they've they planned it that far along, you know. <laughs> uh, Bobby does feel comfortable drafting with Neil, and Neil feels comfortable with Bobby. So, you know, uh, they're going to try and run a steady pace, and uh, we can get in here and work on the car a little bit and hope Quicker. One quick pit note, we talked to Judy Dunleavy, Dick Brooks' crew chief. Remember that Dick Brooks started fifth. He's running about 20th right now. One word answer from Judy, strategy. Well, that's a little more strategy than I thought they would have planned, but this time, see him dropping that far back in the pack. However, there are about, what, 20 to 22 cars running in that lead pack, so he's still not too far behind the lead. Behind the leaders, Petty is back in 10th, and Ricky Rudd in 11th on the tail end of that lead pack, and closing on them is number 98 and 12th, Joe Rutland. 13th is Benny Parsons, 14th at the present time. That is David Pearson with a 15th position belonging to Bouchard. You mentioned Joe Rutland. He had an engine problem the first day of qualifying, qualified the second day, and uh, he, Yarbrough has dropped off the pace. Kale Yarbrough. Kale, do you have a problem? Can you hear us? I'm passing here. Okay. His tail is definitely off the pace right now. Something has happened to that car. He's dropping down on the apron. Everybody going by Yarborough, and so that skein of two wins at, at Michigan and the Daytona 500. So on board camera, it looks like it may be in jeopardy here. As you saw him easing down to the bottom of the racetrack and now headed for Pitt Road, Dale Yarborough, car number 28, who has never won the Talladega 500. He has led it time after time. But it looks like this is going to be another low, another low time. 
He said something about on the right side, so he must have a tire going down or something. Uh, Ken, we could just hear him as he came into the pits telling his crew chief, Waddell Wilson, that he needs a wheel on the right side. Well, they remember at Michigan, he, he fell back two or three times the race and came back to win it. Let's see what's going to happen here. Well, they have him serviced now, and he's headed on down pit road, so light rear tire was changed. So a tough break. Let's see if he can get out in front of the leaders and stay in the lead lap. As he, here he comes. He's coming to speed as he comes down pit road, but the leaders are rapidly approaching through the tri-oval. And it takes a while for him to get his speed up while they're already up to over 200 miles an hour. He's really going to have to accelerate to stay in front of them. That big Talladega Express comes rambling down through the first and second turn. Yarborough is about 300 to 400 yards in front of them as they go into the back straightaway. Of course, the problem that he will have then is the fact that they're hooked up in a draft. They will be able to run faster than he can out there running by himself, even as fast as his car is. I suspect that they'll run him down. Well, there you see him running by himself on the tail end of the lap, and there is the shadow behind him, which is the lead pack closing on Cale Yarborough. Before Kale had his trouble, I was about to mention that Joe Rutten qualified on the second day at over 199 miles an hour, which is about the third or fourth fastest in the field. So that's one reason that he's been able to come up through the pack as well as he has. That car was really running fast. Baker first, Earnhardt in second. They storm down into the first turn. That third spot remains with Perry Labonte. Perry Labonte staying third. That fourth position is Bill Elliott. Bodine is fifth, and Lake Speed is sixth. In the 15th annual Talladega 500. Next Sunday on CBS, we'll bring you a battle of two super featherweights. Undefeated, Hector Macho Camacho takes on Rafael Bazuki Limon in a live 12 round bout. And the real cowboys compete in spear wrestling, calf roping, and bull riding at the Calgary Stampede. All next weekend on CBS Sports, beginning at 4 Eastern live at the Talladega 500 as they wheel them down on a turn number four another time with 32 of the 188 laps complete they are overwhelming Cale Yarborough coming to the tri -oval. and when he came back on the, pit, on the track after making that unscheduled pit stop he was about three and a half seconds ahead of the leaders but now they are moving down at about a half a second a lap you can see Buddy Baker coming up just moving up ever so close every lap the 1976 winner of this event Dave Marcus has retired, the only man to ever win it from the pole. Oil cooler problem. And here comes Baker. And Buddy Baker would like nothing better than to put Cale Yarborough a lap down because he knows how tough he is to beat. And if he can get him 2.6 miles down, that would make it that much easier for him. Just one other driver that wouldn't have to beat at the end. Last lap at an average speed of 196 miles per hour. Now there's Baker sneaking up on the outside, heading to the tri -oval. Baker first, Earnhardt second, Labonte third, still in fourth is Elliott, fifth is Bodine, sixth is Lake Speed, and Mark Martin is in seventh, with Richard Petty in eighth, Joe Rutman in ninth, Waltrip, Darrell Waltrip in the tenth position. Now he should stay with that group, shouldn't he, Ned? Yes, I would think that he'd be able to keep pace with them. In fact, what he would like to do is ride right there on the back bumper of Buddy Baker. Then, should he see the caution lights come on, he would try to draft past him and get back to the lead lap before they get back to the start-finish line. Of course, Dale Earnhardt has some other ideas. He'd like to push Cale back a little bit farther. Back in 11th position is Neil Bonnet driving the Tim Richmond car with Ron Richard in the 12th position. Here are the leaders. 435 laps. Ten pit stops will be coming up for these other drivers in Fort Duval, so that will put Cale Yarborough back in, uh, in good position again because they, they can run about 36 to 38 laps on this track in the tank of fuel. 13th position at the present time is Allison. Benny Parsons is running 14th. Kyle Petty is back in 15th. To the inside, Dale Earnhardt tied around at Nashville and won himself a race. Two races back on the 30 race $8 million NASCAR Grand National Tour. Earnhardt is, uh, is certainly a tough customer. He's one of the hardest chargers on the circuit. He likes to run up front. He enjoys running close with other race cars. Even at the speed that they're running here today. Buddy Baker stays
Clark, the 1975 winner of the Talladega 500, now in the lead. Taylor Yarborough, a lap down to it. The second place car is Earnhardt. Third place, Labonte. And for the moment, they just slipstream along in what is called the Talladega Express. Here is Earnhardt making another approach into turn three on the leader, Baker. Gets by the lap car. Holds up. Runs out of room to run for the lead. And let's go quickly to the port to the pits with Mike Joy. Waddell Wilson, you changed the cut tire on Tail's car, but he continues to slip back in the field. Is there a further problem? Well, it, we had to change the right side, and that may have to stagger up some. So hoping we'll get a caution and uh, in the meantime be able to get our lap back let's, and I'll, get them in here and be able to change all four of them. We but have a major have change in the race. Car number well, 15. We have a major change. Earnhardt seems to be in trouble and backing out of it, and there's some other cars going down at turn three. Bodine's car is slowing way down, coming out of four. You can see the bottom of the racetrack. Car number 88, and he almost, there were cars all over him. It looked like we were going to have an incident in turn number two or three. Car number 90 is pulled on a pit road, and in this last lap, several of the favorites in the event are having problems, and there is Jeff Bodine in number 88. I believe he had late speed right behind him. He really had to hit the brakes and went sideways a bit. Buddy Baker is hitting. Schedule pit stop for him, and here comes his next Terry Levine or Bill Elliott Elliot. right behind him. All of the drivers will be coming in. There's Richard Petty coming out of the pits. He apparently was out of gas. And that was number 90, I believe. Let's go to Larry Newber in the pits. Buddy Baker, who has led much of this race in the early stages, may be a surprise to those of you who have been watching races here at Talladega over the past decade. Is very high, but Buddy Baker has been right on the point all day long. Mike Joy, the other to pit road. A major chassis change on the Dale Earnhardt board. Car owner and crew chief Bud Moore reached in with a ratchet wrench and cranked down about two turns on the left rear of the automobile to try to improve the handling. Ken, as they were giving those reports, Jeff Bodine coasted down pit road as we see Terry Labonte coming into the pit, and there is Bodine in the pit. I think he ran out again as he came off the second turn, had to coast all the way around. That was a costly, you might say, error, but uh, running out again on a track like this is very, very costly. 39 laps are complete. Here's the situation. We're 103 miles into it, and apparently Bodine did run out of fuel, and I believe Earnhardt ran out of fuel. He could very well have. They, they run it uh, almost to the limit, and I'm sure that they were mislead a little bit in their thinking as you see Labonte go back out on the racetrack. That maybe they ran that many laps under caution, did burn as much fuel, thought they could go on a couple of extra laps, but uh, for some of them it didn't work. All right, the leader is now number 27, the Tim Richmond car that Neil Bonnet is driving with these pit stops taking place, but everything will change here. This will be a wholesale change of position as they are coming in for fuel at this time. There is Joe Rutman's 98. There's Richard Teddy coming in. Parsons in the 55. He's pitting. David Pearson has just been in. There is Joe Rutman, set on the pole at Dover, Delaware, earlier this year. And there is the Earnhardt car back out there again and apparently did run out of fuel. Mike Joy. Lord, did he run out of gas? Yeah, we ran out of gas. We were going to pit him that lap, and uh, so he would have been stopping on the 38th lap, but he ran out on the 36th. So I think we'll be all right now. You reached in and made a major chassis change. What does that do when you crank down on that bolt? I didn't quite understand what you were saying. What does it do when you crank down on that bolt when you make the chassis change? Well, we're tightening him up a little bit. He said he was a little bit loose, so we're tightening the car up. Back upstairs. And Ken, when he says a little bit loose, what they've done is shift some weight from the right front to the left rear of that car as Darrell Walker goes back out on the track. Neil Bonnie taking over for Tim Richmond now leading the race. Now, he'll be able to run Ken another eight or ten laps. See, that was the tail end of that caution period, which was about 13 or 14 laps when he was in, and they did fill it up with gas. That's exactly what happened when they replaced Tim Richmond with an eye injury. We'll try to update you on that as soon as possible. And put Neil Bonnet at the controls of car number 27. They popped the tank, so his reign will extend a little further. Lap 10 is when he pitted for fuel, so we can anticipate what? Four more laps? At least another, or maybe half a dozen laps. And one uh, edge that this does give him is uh, that there's a possibility of a caution during this period. The other place there is under the green flag. He might even be lucky enough to catch a caution. Bobby Hill and the 18-year-old out of Midland, Texas. Did we say Oklahoma? Midland, Texas is back on the track at this time. He's been in his fuel. We've had three more cars retired. Cecil Gordon has retired. Dave Marcus, I think we mentioned, he is followed by the way 
inside with an oil cooler problem. Remember, he got stung in that first second lap crash, the first into of the day. And the 10th car to retire was J.D. McDuffie from Sanford, North Carolina, lost the engine on car number 70. So there you see him, Neil Bonnet, not carrying the Warner Hudson car. Bobby Allison, who is running in second place. Now, Allison hasn't made a pit stop, but traditionally, all year long on the circuit, Allison has been able to get better gas mileage than his fellow competitors and still running very fast. So, uh, some of the rest of them have been wondering, what in the world is this fellow doing that has increased his gas mileage that much? But it has happened in practically every race. So, it's Neil Bonham presently in first. Bobby Allison finds himself in second place. Ron Bouchard is currently in third here in the 1983 Talladega 500. We're back with you live at Talladega, Alabama on the world's fastest racing oval. Where right now, Neil Bonnet driving the Tim Richmond car number 27 has command of the race. All the leaders, or the majority of the leaders, have now pitted. This car has not. He had made a late stop. And now it is Neil Bonnet with the advantage. Drafting is the story of Talladega. If you can't ride in a draft at 200 miles an hour, you have a problem. How do they draft? Ned Jarrett filed this report. Seven car draft for the lead. There you see them going down the back straightaway. Here's a slingshot. It's Benny Parsons dropping to the inside. They sacked him almost three deep. Benny Parsons at number 27 going to first place. We've always been told that the art of drafting is a science. With that in mind, we return to Lockheed Smoke Flow Wind Tunnel outside of Atlanta to demonstrate some of drafting's finer points. Last time we were here, we showed you this side view of air flowing over the top of a race car and how a spoiler helped eliminate some of the car's drag. Now with this, the latest innovation in smoke flow wind tunnels, we can give you a new overhead view of how air affects race cars. Look at those switching and swapping of positions out there, David. The draft in air is tremendous. These cars are being sucked and blown around from all spots. The principle of drafting is simple. One car drives through the air, punching a hole in it. And the second car comes through before the hole closes, the advantage is both cars, acting as one, use much less power to break through the air. This principle also works for three cars, four cars, or for as many as are in the draft. Although the second driver has the advantage of being pulled in the first car's wake, he cannot stay there long as no air is reaching his radiator. To avoid overheating, the second driver will back off far enough to retain the advantages of drafting, but not so close as to overheat. From this position, both the second and third cars can build enough momentum to slingshot by the first car. Notice how these drivers working together use a two-car draft to slingshot by the first car. What all this means is the fastest car might not always win. In fact, the winner may come out of thin air. Now, to the outside goes Labonte. At the front end, Labonte is going for the lead. Bouchard comes up the inside. Three cars side by side. Too close to call. A bit of the story of drafting. We've just had a change of position. Car number 27, now being chauffeured by Neil Bonnet, has come in for fuel, and you are watching the leaders as they attack turn three. Terry Labonte's car number 44 is right there with Buddy Baker in the car number 21 as they begin to battle it out. All the leaders have now pitted, and we are looking out Bill Elliott's window. He is in third position. Elliott running third at the present time. Bill is doing a good job of drafting on Buddy Baker's car number 21 as Baker drafts on Terry Labonte. Front three into turn one. Here's a quick report from Mike Joy. Tim Richmond, that must be a frustrating feeling to have your car come in for a pit stop and you not be in it. Well, it was. Uh, it's kind of interesting, though, to see it from this side of the pit, you know, and see how the boys work. I know they do a good job, but I didn't know they was that good. How's your eye and what happened? Well, after the caution, when Neil blew up, uh, we took our, we normally take our goggles off and, and dry our eyes to make sure it keep, keeps from sweating inside the goggles. And when the car slowed down, some kind of air started circulating the car and all the oil dry and dust and, and rubber came up and, and went in my left eye. They got some of it out when we came in and pitted, so, but I couldn't get everything out, so they had to take me to the hospital and got the rest of it out. It's amazing is they put something in there, an antiseptic or something, that's made my eyes swell and got numb. And, and it don't feel right right now, and I'm not going to go out in Talladega and, and run 210 mile an hour with one and a half eyes. So, uh, 
you know, we can't drink old Milwaukee yet, so hopefully I'm going to get back in the car. I feel like it, the numbness is starting to go away, and Neil's doing an excellent job out there, so we're not going to take any chances. If, if it goes green the rest of the way and we don't have a chance to get back in, we're going to let Neil have it the rest of the way. But my eye is getting better, and I will get back in if we do have the right chance. Back up there. 50 laps complete, 138 remaining. Baker fighting with Terry Labonte for the lead. Bill Elliott is in third. Unsecure out there because the fourth place car is bearing down again, and that is number 15, Earnhardt, and Rutman is being shown in fifth, car number 98. Rutman has really made a charge from the front, and he started in 21, 21st position here today, and now running in fifth. That's quite a tribute to him and to Buddy Paris, the crew chief who set the car up so well. Bobby Allison has come to sixth from the 24th starting position, and Richard Petty is in the seventh position. There you see Al Almore car number six, the green car down on the inside, the 24-year-old youngster that we met at the top of our program today. There's the battle for the lead. Baker first, Labonte second, Elliott third. So now Labonte becomes the meat in the sandwich between the two Ford cars, and he knew that they were the cars that he had to be here today because they do draft so well. They handle well in the turns. You can see how stable they are once they approach the turns at up to 200 miles an hour. But Labonte's car is handling well, too. Dale Inman is the crew chief on his car, and Inman was with Richard Petty when Petty won about 190 of his 197 Grand National victories. So he knows what it's all about, how to set a car up and make it handle well. There's Richard Petty, seventh position, car number 43, a couple of wins this year. Coming up in two weeks, they're going to have Richard Petty Day uh, down at Level Cross, North Carolina. There you see the 27 car coming after him. They're going to open up the whole place and raise money for the volunteer fire department. Get a chance to go all through his compound, and he's opening the entire Petty facility. Uh, they have to update their fire equipment and buy new band uniforms, and that's how they're going to do it in Level Cross. Well, they'll be commemorating his 25th year in Grand National Competition, and what a career that has been. Fires may be the story. Here's Larry Newman. Came off of Ron Bouchard's car was a routine tire change. You know the temperature on these tires as the tire meets the racing surface is supposed to be about 190 to 200 degrees. This tire got so hot, no problem with the tire, but it got so hot that it actually melted the paint that was used to read out Goodyear. It was that hot on the racetrack, and that's an unusual situation. Mike Joy covering the other end of the pitch today with yet another story from down here where it's about 100, I'd say. <laughs> It's just about that, Larry. Joe Rutman started back in the 11th row. He's now in the top five. That thing really must be working for you, buddy, Parrot. Well, Mike, it really is. Uh, the car's working real good. We just had a right side change. Got to look at the look at the tires. We we uh, we took the tire temperatures and it looked real good. And uh, maybe we'll have a good day for this Levi Garrett uh, Benfield racing team. Did you have to make a chassis change? No, we uh, we didn't have to make a chassis change. The car's riding about neutral right now, and uh, if this weather stays in you know, the overcast skies, that's really going to help us a lot. And uh, like I said, we've had a few problems in the last few races, but maybe we can run 500 miles and give the fans a show today. Kim, Joe Rutman who gave us quite a show at Daytona a couple of years back. Here's Baker going through traffic. There you see Bodine's car and Benny Parsons number 55. And Bodine is about to go a lap down, and we understand that Benny Parsons had to make an extra pit stop, so he is, we're assuming that he's going a lap down also. Bodine did run out of gasoline. That put him farther back in the field. Now he's about to go a lap down. 90 car also going to lap down. Richard Brooks, who won it in 73. The man out in front. And there's Bill Elliott passing car number 90. Richard Brooks, the 73 winner. The man who won it in 19... I want to say 75, Buddy Baker in the lead. Here he is closing up on Bodine. Baker loves this track. He loves to run fast. Well, he's the only driver to win three in a row on this racetrack and one of, uh, what, two drivers to win four here. I think Darrell Walker has four wins and Baker is the only other driver that has won that many times here. Terry Labonte stays right there in second place. Terry Labonte holding out of that second spot and Bill Elliott maintaining third. But the rest of the field is gathering up on that trio. The fourth position is Earnhardt. The fifth position being Rutman. There you see a little further back. That next battle behind us is about a half second behind. Back to five. There is Earnhardt. And right with him comes Neil Bottom and Richard Petty. Petty now being seven. So we'll be back with more of this Talladega 500 shortly. CBS live coverage of the Talladega 500 continues after this word from your local station.
This is CBS. There's a thunder rolling across the Carolinas in the form of Ford Thunderbird. Quality control has been excellent. In fact, I've been so impressed that I purchased the black Thunderbird for my son. The dollar value of the 1983 Thunderbird is the best of any of the automobiles that I looked at. Quality is here, and you're not going to pay any extra for it. Take a test drive down Thunder Road at your Carolina Ford dealer today. Ford's done it right. Mr. Copper Buyers, General Copper and Brass Company of Collingdale has a full line of copper and copper alloy in sheets, rods, and tubes. Our services include slitting, sawing, and shearing. General Copper has bearing bronze up to 24-inch OD and 105 inches long. Whether your order is large or small, make General Copper and Brass Company of Collingdale, Pennsylvania your first call. Thank you. WKRP ignites at 11.30. This CBS Sports Special is sponsored by Refreshing Hawaiian Punch. Speed Stick Deodorant, the Wide Stick. Effective protection in just a few strokes. Speed Stick by Menon. And by the makers of Skoll and Copenhagen. A pinch is all it takes. In the 58th, uh, 59th lap at the present time, Bobby Allison has fallen back to the 8th position behind Richard Petty as things are lining up. And there you see the leader, Buddy Baker, from lap traffic, Jeff Bodine, staying right there in the 88 car, the green and white car. The second place car is currently Terry Labonte, right there behind Baker. And there is Bill Elliott showing you a picture of what it looks like from third position as he addresses the business of trying to catch the blue and yellow, number 15 in second pulling up to lap Jeff Bodine as they wheel down into turn number one. Bodine's car is certainly capable of running with the leaders in. The difference is that he ran out of gas and now he finds himself a lap down. He would like to try to stay up there in case the caution comes out that he can ram past him. But here's Terry Labonte wanting to lead again. And there you see the standings after 50 laps. That's after 50 laps. It's Baker first, Labonte second, Elliott third, Earnhardt, Rutland, Allison, Petty, Bonnet, Nine through 16, Dale Yarborough, Lake Speed, Ricky Rudd, Ron Bouchard, Darrell Waltrip in here, Kyle Petty, and Joe Rutland, Mark Martin, Terry Gant, Morgan Shepard, David Pearson. That Terry Gant car on the last report was in 17th position. Well, those two cars still maintain. Here is Cale Yarborough coming in another time. Yarborough back on pit road another time. Now, he made his uh, pit stop earlier than the others, Ken, because of the flat tire. You can see them cleaning the windshield as Kale gets uh, the car put in gear and ready to go once they get the service on it. They are changing the left side tires on his car this time around. They changed the right side the other time, so now he's ready to go, and we'll watch him go down pit road as he accelerates back up to speed, changing the gears. They have four-speed transmission in these cars. You start off in first and then just change right on through the gears, right in the fourth and out on the track. Earnhardt has taken the lead. Baker comes back for it. Here's Larry Newbert. With Leonard Wood, the crew chief on Buddy Baker's machine. You know, Leonard Buddy leads the league and wins here for this racetrack. He's led more laps to this race. So I'm a little surprised to see him running so hard so early. This race is normally very high in attrition. Well, we kind of let him make his own decision, you know, whether to lead out front or run behind, depending on whether he's abusing the car. But if you stay out front, you're keeping the engine cool, you know, because the air is getting to the radiator, you know, and cooling the engine down. But you burn a little bit more gas that way, but, uh, you know, if he wants to lead and can't lead, I'd just soon even be out there. One of the reasons why you hired him, wasn't it? Well, that's correct. But he led 460 laps of this race going into the day, and he's adding to that total every lap he's out there. Rookie of the Year, 1980 Grand National Champion, took a stab at first place. Now he falls back a bit as Baker rolls around the outside and goes to the lead. And here is Elliott going up to second place. Bill Elliott in the second. That's almost a total independent team. His brother Ernie builds the motors down in Dahlonega, Georgia. He had fours running one and two. And the last time he had a total fours, I believe, was 1968 Atlanta. 
has been quite a while. Sienna Perse uh, are somewhat in the minority as far as numbers of cars in the field, but uh, since the recent rule change, the Fords have really been running good. Baker won at Daytona, then Earnhardt won at Daytona. 1969, 5500. They swept five spots that day. And it happened again today. You'll know at lap 188 in our live coverage of the Talladega 500. For the moment, you have Fords running first and second with Baker in front. Elliott in second, and the Chevrolet of Terry Labonte in third. Well, now Earnhardt has taken that position, so you have the Fords in the first three positions. Right, and back goes Labonte to the fourth spot, hanging out in the back end of that group, and they out back straight away. Cancel all of that to change the position. The car of Joe Rutman is in fifth. Back to the inside comes Terry Labonte at number 44. On the bottom of the track, he's up to third. 64 laps complete this time by. Here's part of the one they estimate. The Bama Patrol says there's 95 to 100,000 people here today. Lamonte lost the draft and falls way back, and I think he's losing an engine. Trouble on the car number 44 of Terry Labonte. You see the smoke coming from him. He quickly gets down on the inside of the racetrack, in which is a very smart thing to do. And Caution is out. out. Caution is out. Second caution of the day, as they fear he may have thrown some oil down as he went into the corner. He was right in the groove, and yellow is on the track for the second time. Very heads up driving by Terry Labonte and the fellows behind him. He, he gave him the hand signal, I'm sure, as he went in there. Look at Yarborough trying to roll through traffic. You see him coming around. Remember, they race back to the line, and Yarborough is trying like the Dickens to get a lap back. He's trying to get and so is Bodine in the 88. They're working together. This and is one time they need here to comes the 15 up to put him a lap down. They have him in a sandwich for the tri-oval. Here they come to the line. Bodine is going to stay in there. Bodine got his lap back. It was very close as far as tail. We think he did, but it was too close to call. We'll let you know in a moment. Dale was really happy there by the move of Dale Earnhardt trying to put it that left back down. Here's Labonte's car as it coasts to the pit. We may have a replay to take a look at what happened to Terry Labonte at some just about 200 miles an hour. Let's watch what happens here. He's right up in the groove. That's not, uh, that is, there you see him on the inside. As Tail goes past on the outside, Neil Bonnick went right on Tail Yarborough's bumper, but you can see what uh, what he was looking at, the smoke as he came up on it. We have seen cars that smoke worse than that, but it really blocks the view of the driver as uh, they come up on a smoking car, and that's always a big concern. But Labonte very alert. They got the car down on the inside of the racetrack, and the others saw his signal, got on the outside. We understand that Kale did get his lead, get back in the lead lap. Let's go to Mike Joyce Pitt. Here's the second-place car, Bill Elliott. Right side tires, a clean of the windshield, 22 gallons of gasoline. They're going for all four tires this time. They'll change all four on Elliott's car. Let's go to Larry Newber. Has been among the leaders, particularly the last 20 or 30 green flag laps. Rubber all the way around, all four sides. The first thing that Dale reached for was a bag of ice. Mike Joy. Routine pit stop on Waltrip's car. You see Jeff Hammond sling that 65 pound jack around. Waltrip gets a soft drink of water, throws some on the windshield to help clean it as they will change all four tires on the Junior Johnson Chevrolet driven by Darrell Waltrip. Mm -hmm. The defending champion, Darrell Waltrip, there. Just getting back out. It looks almost as crowded in the, the pit area there as those 100,000 people up in the grandstands here. But the drivers do take advantage of these caution periods to come in and change those tires. This is the first time they had the opportunity to change those left side tires. And as both of our pit reporters uh, said, the drivers that are in now are changing all four tires during this caution period. Here's Buddy Baker. He apparently is back out first, right behind the pace car. What a misfortune for Terry Labonte. They really thought they had it gathered up. Late yesterday, everyone was saying he was the driver to watch. Still has registered that one win and one only in Darlington back in 1980. Well, I was mistaken. Buddy Baker had not made a pit stop. He was, of course, the leader behind the pace car, but he's coming into the pit right now. So we have completed 66 of the 188 circuits around the Talladega Speedway, and we'll be back with more in a moment. At the world's fastest motor speedway here in Talladega, Alabama, with Ned Jarrett, I'm Ken Squire, topside, and we're going to take you back just a few moments to what could be the turning point in this race. Car number 28 and the green and white number 88. 88 is Bodine, 28 is Yarborough. They were a lap down. 
They were trying to make their lap up after a blown engine on Terry Labonte. Trying to keep them a lap back was the 15 on the inside of Earnhardt, the 21 of Baker on the outside. They were running for the lead. Watch what happens here. As they approach the start finish line, Labonte, I mean, the tail is on the back bumper of Badai, not really on the back bumper, but he picked up the draft of him, and with the car of Earnhardt on the inside and Baker on the outside, I think Bodine helped to suck tail just enough. When they got to the start finish line, you can see maybe he was a foot ahead, and that could make a big difference in the end of this race. Less, less. Let's go to Mike Joy. Again, here's Mike Joy. Terry Labonte brought out this caution. What happened? Well, I don't know. The Budweiser Chevy uh, was running awful good, and I was coming down the front straightaway, and it started uh, losing a little bit of power, and I guess it spun a bearing or something. Knocked a hole in the pan, but, uh, you know, the car was running good, and we kind of unusual for us to have engine trouble, so we'll just be back next week. Looks like you won't be in the garage long. You've been asked to relief drive? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Kyle's a little sick right now, and I, he wants somebody to drive his car. Back upstairs. Well, when he says Kyle, he's talking about Kyle Petty as he drives the car number seven. And we're ready to go racing again. Then. Six try for Labonte. Still on his way. 98 is the top of pitch. Joe Rutland as the field comes down with Earnhardt in the lead. And the second place car is Bill Elliott in the number nine. As they scoot into the first turn, Neil Bonnet. Here's Kale's car. Remember, he is on the tail end of the lead lap. And look at the traffic in front of him as we get back underway. And Baker is coming out very slowly. Buddy Baker has just slipped off pit road and down into turn one. He is in big trouble. 18 cars are in the lead lap, and you can call it 17. Something is really amiss with Buddy Baker. There you see him hardly rolling about 65, 70 miles an hour down on the bottom of turn one. Meanwhile, the leaders are in turn three. Again, it looked like when Baker made his pit stop a moment ago that maybe he had lost the brakes on that car. Of course, that's not causing him to go slow right now. There might be something else wrong as the leaders come down and put Joe Rutt by the lap down. And Joe is coming out of the pit now. He lost the top five before that caught him. He's coming out very slowly as well. Bonnet drops to the inside. Allison is right there, too, in the hunt. As they line him up two by two at a turn number one. Neil Bonnet thrust car number 27 back in front. There's the 27 on the low side. The high side is Earnhardt out of turn number three. his attack now and there is the picture from bill elliott's car as they swing down into turn number three working lap 71. Again, bobby allison likes to lead any race that he possibly can but it's always an incentive there he's leading the grand national point standing going into this race today there is a five point bonus for any driver who leads the lap and that could make the difference in the championship at the end of the year that is the parsons car that's up there and still hanging on the tail end is the harry gant car the Parsons car is running right up there, and he is running a lap down. He is a lap down. Benny Parsons, right behind the leader in the 55 car, is running a lap away. He's trying to make that lap up right now. Bobby Allison has fought his way from 24th position in the lead. And now another member of the Alabama gang, Neil Bonnet, down the inside, takes the lead. Bonnet goes into first. Allison dropping back a bit up to the banking. Parsons has his lap made up. Third spot is Earnhardt. Gang warfare out of turn four into the tri-oval. Getting a bit of a draft off Parsons is Neil Bonnet in the 27 car, replacing Tim Richmond. Third is Allison, fourth is Earnhardt, fifth is Bodine, sixth is Elliott. Earnhardt's car, after the debate, that adjustment seems to be working very well. Let's go to Larry Newber. He's with the Buddy Baker team. Ned, we're just about absolutely certain the only problem Buddy has is brakes. We say he has no brakes, we mean no brakes at all. That's why he went so slow coming around the last lap. He was hoping to go slow enough so when he came down the pits he would be able to stop. We didn't know whether or not Buddy was going to try and bring it here to his pit stall or take it back to the garage, and now it looks as though Buddy has pulled her behind the wall. Yes, Mike he has. Boy. They're in the garage, Ken. They're going to try to fix that car, get some brakes in it, get it back in the race. We'll go and get the story for you. Fortunate for Buddy Baker. Just barely in the lead lap. There is Benny Parsons. Car number 55. He's never won this race. 1973 national champion. Neil Bonnet locked up in a draft with him. Then it's 20 car lengths back to the second place car. Which remains Dale Earnhardt. 
But third place is Bodine, who did that incredible job of making up that lap in the Cliff Stewart car. Putting Carson one lap down, Neil Mott. And there wasn't a great deal that Benny Carson could do about that, Jim, because Neil just simply picked up the draft, moved right around him, and put in that lap down. Now, Benny has had one of the fastest cars. He qualified in third position, but he made an extra pit stop under the green a while back, and that's the reason he's a lap down. As they charge back to the line, another time it will be bonded in first, Earnhardt in second, Bodine in third, Allison in fourth, Elliott is in fifth, Bouchard is up into the sixth position, late speed hanging right in there. You're looking out now on the field as they go through turn one and two. Dale Yarborough's car right in there behind Lake Speed. Lake Speed has done a, a Mississippi driver has done a terrific job today with a hot belly car. He's been right up here in the middle of this lead lap. Yes, he has, Ken. He ran a very good race here in May, the spring race at Talladega. I think he finished in third place and ran with the leaders all day long. He likes this racetrack as many of the other drivers do. Bodine made that lap up now in third spot. Saw his wife a little earlier down there on Pitt Road. Out of the lap stop for him. He is third. Allison fourth. Bouchard down on the inside working on Elliott. Behind them comes Lake Speed and then following along is Dale Yarborough. Yarborough is in eighth. And Yarborough has made up the lap he has lost. Sure, those leaders aren't too happy about that. No, oh, they are absolutely one of the toughest competitors that they ever run up against as we see Earnhardt move into the lead there in the car number 15. Bodine follows around but here comes Neil Bonnet back on the inside for third for second. Fixing the tires up for some more tire changes here putting those blood bolts on. Back they come out of turn four. Elliott's up to fourth. 195 mile an hour last lap. Now there's Bill Elliott right in there behind Jeff Bodine. That's now third place that you're looking at from the fourth place car. Bill Elliott out of Dobsonville, Georgia, Dahlonega area. Look how close Neil Bonnet is running on the back bumper of Dale Earnhardt. Now that is drafting at its best. He drops back just a little bit as they go into the turn, drops about a half a car limb below him, but as they accelerate off the turn, then he's able to move right back up on him. That is doing a good job of that. Here again is Larry Newman. Well, Ken, we are going to have another driver change. Kyle Petty, as we put it earlier, definitely apparently has a flu problem. Terry Labonte standing by. We were just talking with Mike Dean, Kyle crew chief a couple minutes ago. Terry showed up, but now they're getting the final instructions. The biggest concern here is the height difference between Kyle, who's kind of long-legged, and Terry. Terry's about my size. I like to call that normal, around 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, Kyle has these lanky legs. Final instructions right now coming in from Mike Bean to uh, Terry Labonte. He's flat, flat 49. 20, and I said, loose, and he never said anything. So I said, well, you know, we'll just wait to have it cost. And I said, is it loose? He said, I'm sick. I said, okay, you know, so we'll just go by it. You know, if they have the cost, and you know, I'll ask you, okay? It is Kyle's decision. He'll be making that decision from the cockpit. Lake Speed is running the Haas Ellington car up in fifth position, car number one. An Ellington car one here with Donnie Allison back in 1977. There's Kaylee Yarborough's car. As he continues to nip away, he is now up into fourth position. Yarborough is in fourth, but someone is out on his left flank, giving him a little trouble as they go into the back straightaway. There he is in that fourth spot. The battle on to win the 15th annual Talladega 500. Will it be an old war horse or a new name? We'll know in 188 laps. Next weekend on CBS Sports, the 74th U.S. Clay Court Championship. Defending single champion Jose Hugueras and Virginia Rizek are expected to face stiff competition from a strong international field. Saturday, we'll show you the women's singles final and Sunday the men. Join CBS next Saturday, 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central and Pacific. Guess who's back in first place? 
made his lap up and here in our live coverage of the Talladega 500, Kaylee Arborough is again showing the way with Neil Bonnet driving the Tim Richmond car in second. Morgan Shepard has retired. While we were away, Morgan Shepard came in. Two laps back, they averaged 196 miles per hour. Now look at car number 15 driving down onto the inside at about 200 miles an hour. And pulling alongside Neil Bonnet. Here's Earnhardt in the second place and approaching Kaylee Arborough, the leader, in turn three and four. Earnhardt's car does seem to be working very well in the draft, Ken, and that will absolutely be a key here this afternoon as they put another lap on Al Elmore down on the inside. But Neil Bonnet, he doesn't like running back there in third, but he can't quite make it that time. Up into the fifth position has come Darrell Waltrip. He's beginning to show some muscle on number 11. And we thought he was also showing some smoke. It looks like there's some smoke off car 11. There you see the third place car, Bonnet. The fourth place car, and I wonder if it's tire smoke, Neil. Car number 11. It does look like when he goes off that second turn that there is some smoke coming from that car, but it's just on the straightaway. I can't see any on the street. Whether it's uh, maybe stripping a little bit as he goes into the turn, so you can see it looks like there's a little smoke coming from that. We'll have some of our pit reporters to check on that and see if he does have a problem, but it certainly isn't an effect you can see. Bouchard is in fourth. And you, there again, you saw look, what appeared to be smoke up that far. Number 11, Darrell Walker in fifth. Well, that story, here's Mike Joy. Jeff Hammond. He's talking with car owner Junior Johnson. Jeff, they're looking for the tire, seeing a little smoke from the car. What is it, that smoke? It might be a little bit of a tire rubbing, just a little bit, or just a little bit of secret cool, but otherwise everything else is fine. And, you know, we just, that's a little uh, concern that really nobody needs to be worried about right now, because we're running fine. Yeah. No problem with Daryl or anything in here. Back to you, Kev. Great speed is the car number one that is in the sixth position, right behind Daryl Walker, who won it last year, the only man to win this race twice. Back to the lead. Yarborough making up a lap and out in front again. What a remarkable performance by the Waddell Wilson crew in the Rainier car. And there's more smoke off that number 11. It sure appears as if something's rubbing. Yes, it does, Ken. And it looks like as he comes off of the turn, when there's a shifting in the body or shifting of the weight, is when it's happening. So as Jeff Hammond pointed out, it could be that it's rubbing a little bit. It might not be a major problem, but I'm sure it's something that they'd like to get in and take a look at, but they'd like to do it under a caution. Bill Elliott is back to seventh. Richard Petty is in eighth. Bo Dine is back there in ninth. And Jim, now the Kale Yarborough has moved out front. The pace has picked up. The last lap around, he ran 197.8, where they were running about 196. Someone else was leading. That was lap 85, 103 remaining. We've had two cautions thus far. 14 cars have retired. Mike Potter's number 76 has fallen out. And the latest retiree, Morgan Shepard, was the 14th of the 40 cars that started. Latest report had 15 cars in the lead lap. David Pearson is running in the tail end of the lead lap in 15th position, running 14th is Harry Gann, and 13th on the overall is Mark Martin. Back to the lead. Buddy Eric's in car number 67 going a lap down. Buddy has a has a new type of a fan club. He's got a guy from Pennsylvania that has set up a fan club and to join it. Every bit of the money goes into his racing operation. So that's going to help Buddy out a little bit. He doesn't have a major uh, sponsor. Meanwhile, running all out back, free and lonesome, Al Almore, the 24-year-old driver who's making his first try at a super speedway today. Staying in it, staying out of trouble, and that's what counts. He's hanging right in there, and when the cars have lapped him, he's moved down out of the way, as he was told to do in the NASCAR driver's meeting, and uh, doing a good job. Here's a, is that Ron Bichard it coming sure in making a good move? 1981 winner right there. And then he made that dramatic move under Walter and Jerry Lamotti. Well, he knows what that's all about down there. He's been there before. Running side by side with Earnhardt is Ron Bouchard from Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, number 47. We had a little problem with our signal that day. Went black towards the end, and he's falling back a bit now. Father of the Pittsburgh man, slightly perplexed. The television set, or attempted to put it through the wall. And that car came to the finish line. We have no picture of that day. Trust that won't happen today. It looks like we're in for another typical Talladega finish. Well, Tim, the reason that he's falling back there, he tried to make that move on the inside, trying to move up into second position. And once he got out of line, they were all grabbing the seat and they were able just to pull right on around him. And that can happen. Sometimes you get left out there uh, hanging out and the others go all by you. So you have to be very careful when you make that move. I would imagine those 
spotters around the track were really watching that car number 11, the one that is in fourth position, the one of Darrell Waltrip right there. You see him running just behind Cale Yarborough, Dale Earnhardt, and Neil Bonnet, because he is showing smoke each time around. And that, if there is something rubbing at these kinds of speeds, it doesn't take very long for a tire to really change shape. Well, it really doesn't, and it would depend a great deal on whether the rubbing would be on top of the tire, on the flat surface of it, or on the side. There's very little, little rubber on the side, as we see it again as it comes off of the turn. That's when it seems to be the worst. There's very little rubber on the side of the tires, and it wouldn't take long for it to rub through, but I suspect that when it comes off the turn, that the body is going down on the tire and causing it. Now, I don't know, Ned, if this is a sight shot, but Lake Speed has complained via his two-way radio and then on to NASCAR that Waltrip is leaking oil. Lake Speed is claiming that his windshield is spattered with oil. Okay. The, that's that car right in front of Bill Elliott. Yes. Well, Bill, if you mind well. pulling up, we can take a look at the windshield. <laughs> he can't hear us during the course of the race, but there's the car that has signaled on his own radio. Maybe he did hear you. He pulled right up. <laughs> that uh, he is getting some oil off car number 11. That has been reported in that car. And see what happens here. Well, it's a little strange. Most of the time, it's an oil leak. You would see it on the straightaways as well as in the turns, and we're only seeing that on the turns, but uh, I don't know. How about on the valve cover? Well, it, it could be, it's but... Awfully low. It's way back. Yes, it is. It's, it's uh, towards the rear end of the car. Of course, that could be that it would be a, a rear uh, axle seal or something like that leaking a little bit. Meanwhile, the leader remains. Cale Yarborough up in that first spot. He's come from a lap back and fought his way back into this position over the second place car, the familiar yellow and blue cars of the tough customer Dale Earnhardt. And here comes another approach from Waltrip now, the only man to win it twice. He won it last year and won it in 79. He's right there barking. And now it looks like there's a little more smoke going from a car and dropping down on the inside. Definitely smoke coming from one car, and he got out of the It might have been Lake Speed, or it might have been... It is the car number one of Lake Speed. Lake car. Speed's car, the one who was complaining that his windshield was being covered by a foreign matter. He is now on pit road in the Haas Ellington car, the team that won here in 1977. Still, Yarborough in front. Excuse me. Again, Ken, Lake was very alert. They got the car down out of the line of traffic so that it did not jump over. We see the, the smoke coming from Darrell Walker's car once again as he comes off of that turn. But Lake Speed, very up to the front, getting his car into the pit area safely. Speed's car is down. Remember, he's been running in sixth position. Working on it now. Meanwhile, Cale Yarborough trying to win the Talladega 500 for the first time stays in front. <laughs> on CBS Sports this Sunday afternoon, the final round coverage of the Canadian Open, where Ralph Landrum, the rookie, is in front by one stroke over Johnny Miller and Ed Perser, who's been right up in it from day one, is just another stroke back. Andy Beam having a good round for 17 holes. That's next this afternoon. Oakville, Ontario, here on CBS. Will a rookie win there? Will a rookie win here? Cale Yarborough, a veteran, has never won it. He's currently leading. We have just received the halfway marker on the field. They are halfway, and we've had a report from the backstretch of a light battering of rain. Another factor. Now that we are halfway, if it should start to rain, they could call it at any time then. Yes, they could. Again, of course, they make every effort to get him every lap off the race that was advertised. And uh, even though there have been some clouds floating around here today, everybody felt that there would be an excellent chance, of course, completing the full 500 miles. Well, there you see 95 of the 188 laps complete. 93 to go, 252 miles down, 25 lead changes. What was it, 72 years back? Average speed down considerably from the 174 miles an hour that Lenny Pond cranked out when he drove a Harry Rainier car to victory lane here in 1978, 77. And now Kelly Arbor is trying to get Rainier another win. And Kim, those lead changes that we're seeing on the, the leaderboard there do not include the number of times that they changed somewhere around the racetrack. That is on the official lead changes back at the start finish line. Cale Yarborough is in first. He has made up a lap most dramatic fashion, as you saw a bit earlier here in our CBS Flag to Flag coverage. The second spot remains with Dale Earnhardt. Holding on, hugging second place, and right behind him comes Darrell Walton in that third position in car number 11. And there's Neil Bonnet, driving the difference for number 27 and four. And we have 
pit stops coming up very shortly here, Ken. There'll be scheduled pit stops. In fact, Jeff Bodine has already come into the pit. Remember, he ran out of gas a little bit earlier. He's not going to take that chance again. That fifth spot is Bill Elliott carrying our second CBS onboard camera. There's Bill Elliott looking at the fourth place car. We might get a look here at that smoke they were talking about off car number 11, Darrell Waltrip. Well, as we see him on the straightaway, we can't see any evidence of that smoke. But as they approach the turn, we'll see that's where it has been coming from Darrell Walker's car. It looks like from the left rear as he comes out of the turn. We're still watching as Bill Elliott doing a good job of drafting. Now Bill's going to decide to pass him up on the outside. Here's Earnhardt on pit road. Second place car pulling in. Pit stop under green. Bud Mets flying, the tires coming on, the Bud Moore crew, this is where they're at their best. They're watching the time, ticking away as they put the fuel in, change two tires on Dale Earnhardt. One at Nashville, two races back, they push him away. Not bad for two tires for fuel net. No, here's going to be a driver change, right here. Let's go to Larry Newbert. Well, as I commented before, Kyle will make the decision during this pit stop. Right now, he's in very close consultation with his crew chief, Mike Beam. They've been together for quite a number of years. Kyle has chosen to stay in the car. Terry Labonte standing by with a jury rigged helmet as far as the radio communications, but no goal, at least on this pit stop. 10 and 10, unless it's absolutely necessary. They couldn't afford to make a pit stop on a green, I mean, to make a driver change on a green flag pit stop because it would simply take too much time. They'll hope for a caution if they're going to do that. Now you see Elliott pulling up. And we have our CBS cameras and first and second spot for a moment out here. Late speed retirement has been officially announced. 15th car out of the field. Late speed. That break for him is fourth try here, and he was running so well today. I think we're going to see Waltrip coming in as number 90 goes around him. This is the time when they all should be coming in. No, indeed, it is the second place car. Bill Elliott getting ready to come up on the pit road. Elliott to the floor, drops down. Here he comes into the pits. This taking place in lap 99. Actually, lap 100. You're inside Elliott's car as he pulls up and his cousins and brothers and friends from Dawsonville, Georgia, go to work. Now, you notice how they clean the windshield on these cars, Ken. That's the fellow back across the wall that has that uh, special apparatus. They're only allowed five men over the wall, and you can see those five men to work on the car. That's a NASCAR official standing up in front of the car as he moves away. Actually, that's Waddell Wilson waiting for Cale Yarber to come in, I believe, but there is going to be a NASCAR official on the scene when they make these stuff. Counting bodies to make sure they don't put too right. many over. They'll penalize them, bring oh, them yeah. into their lap if they catch an extra man over the wall. And here Cale is coming into the pit, so the leader coming in, and Richard Petty coming in right behind him. All of them be coming in before too long because they are getting low on gas as we watch Kale come down pit road. Now, part of the way you make up time is being very smooth getting in and getting out. It isn't just the pit stop itself when those men come over the wall, those tire changers and jackmen go to work. But if you have a really good driver who is consistently quick on getting in and out, uses the brakes properly, you can make up three or four seconds. And the second here is 300 feet on the racetrack. It can make a big difference in how quickly you're able to accelerate, not break the wheels loose. We see Kale, he made a 16 one second second pit stop. Very good. Richard Petty proved beat him a little bit because Petty came in behind Kale. Now Kale is going out on the racetrack behind Petty. So he has some catching up to do. And uh, whether that difference was on pit road or whether part of it was in approaching the pits and going out. Richard Petty coming back to full steam. He's won here one. The man in front is the man who's the only man to win it twice. There he is. Waltrip at number 11, and Harry Gant is very much up in the hunt now. He is being shown in fifth position overall. And they're saying there's a crack developing in Bill Elliott's front windshield, and there you see it. Crack beginning to develop. The stress on those windshields as they batter through the wind at 200 miles an hour. It's a wonder. Remember one time uh, Kelly Arbor had one land in his lap before he put those three stress boards in back of those windshields. It can happen. There is a lot of pressure there, but if one has to crack, the one in Elliott's car is the best place. It's on the right-hand corner. Walter ready to pit. And Harry Gant ready to pit. We'll see if they take a look at what might be causing that smoke. Of course, their greatest concentration will be on changing uh, right-side tires and gasoline. Mike Joy is there. Here's Walter. 
Wallace are bringing the car down to a stop next to the pit wall. Jeff Hammond puts the car in the air. Henry Benfield adds the gasoline, and Waltrip gets a drink as they service the car. It's the only break these drivers get in the running of a 500-mile race. They are not going under the hood to check on that possible oil leak problem. Let's go to Ken Squire. Back comes number 11, Kelly Arbor. There you see the 55 and the 33 rolling out. And the number three, at number three, is the Richard Childress car. Ricky Rudd controls of that. He loves to pull an upset here today, and they've been running well. He got his first victory ever a couple of months ago at Riverside, California, on the road course. Leader Pitty, number 27, Bonnet, coming in. The Richmond car. They changed three members on the crew just about four races ago. They've had two third places, a win, and one DNF. They're doing something right now. Yes, they are. Tim Brewer, a young uh, crew chief, worked with Junior Johnson several years ago. Actually, he started his career with Richard Childress, then went to work with Junior Johnson. A couple of years ago, went to work with M.C. Anderson when Cale Yarborough was the driver there. And then, of course, this year when M.C. Anderson sold out his uh, racing operation to Raymond Beetle, he went with him. And now Eddie Clark and Barry Dodson and Pete Peterson from the old team have joined the new team. And the team seems to be really working together. Here they are coming back out. Good Richmond's pit stop. Best finish. And this race was seventh his rookie year here. Neil Bonnet is now, as we mentioned before, driving that car after uh, Tim Richmond put something into his eye and he'll be taken out of the car. Now there you see Benny Parsons and Harry Gant. And the patrons on uh, that car Vandals are not here today. Jimmy Vandal in the hospital and her friends trackside as well as in the racing area down there. Wanted to know she is missed today. She's done a lot with the motorsports and with those two cars in the past several years. They certainly have. Bobby Allison is being shown as the leader now. Now, Allison has not pitted. Remember, a little earlier here this afternoon when they made their pit stops under green, Allison went about four or five laps longer than any of the other drivers. That could work to his advantage here as we go on in the race. They run him out of phase, is what they say, and keep him just a little bit different from the other cars in the racetrack. And here he is pitting right now. Bobby Allison, the leader of the Alabama gang, the leader in the Talladega 500, coming out of pit row. CBS Sports, live coverage of the Talladega 500 will continue after this word from your local station. We're back with you once again. The 400,000 looking on at another great NASCAR Grand National Battle. This one at the Alabama International Motor Speedway at Talladega, Alabama. Ned Jarrett, I'm Ken Squire. It's track side as you watch Richard Petty working alongside Harry Gant at this point. Kaylee Arbor right in there in a battle for second place by our lights. The leader overall in the event we have is Dale Earnhardt at the present time in car number 15. Now here's Harry Gant for the first time today in the Hal Needham car beginning to move around. And here is a picture of Richard Petty. Nicely taken for you as the battle continues. A little further back in the field, Cale Yarborough's car right there with Richard gets a bit of an advantage. There are your leaders, first and second, Earnhardt and Jeff Bodine. My, what a day Bodine is having. He really is, Ken, considering the fact that he ran out of gas early in the race, got a lap down, very alertly made it up when the caution was coming out and has been running right with the leaders ever since. Joe Rutland comes out very slowly on a pit row down into turn number one. He, like Baker earlier, limping, he's trying to pull up on the bank, sort of clawing his way up, having some problems in turn one. Rutland was running well up in front for a while. The leaders down the back straightaway, Earnhardt, Bodine, and watch the story as the race continues to be the weather. Have a big buildup of clouds that look a little formidable off the back straightaway here. This race has never been short-ended by weather. We are now at 108 laps. Dale Earnhardt, the leader. Jeff Bodine in second. 1980 Grand National Champion. Here are two drivers here that, that got experience taking the hard knock, so to speak, on the short tracks around the country. Jeff Bodine growing up in a racing atmosphere. His dad uh, ran a racetrack in New York, and uh, so he was around them all of his life. Big winner in modified sportsman type competition. Earnhardt, winner in late model sportsman dirt track racing. And they really paid their dues. They deserve everything that they're getting in the sport today. Dale Earnhardt seeking his ninth career win here today. And that car seems to really be tickled by this track. It just seems to settle in and look so comfortable out there. That's part of the problem with this track that you pointed out earlier. The minute you begin to feel comfortable here, you can turn around and 
doesn't like you. It certainly is. You have to always be uh, uh, concentrating 100%. You can never let your thoughts go away just for a second because uh, it could mean disaster for you. Let's go back a little. In the third position now, it is Cale Yarborough with fourth, the Richard Petty car. Going fifth is the Neil Bonnet car. And this flock of automobiles that are running, that's the tail end of that group. In the back straight away. with the leaders. Earnhardt, Bodine, and they seem to be building up a bit of an advantage. They have now, what, two and a half, three seconds? Yes, they do have, and I suspect that that's sort of a plan situation as far as uh, Bodine is concerned. He seems to be content running there on the back bumper of Dale Earnhardt. It's working well for them. They're able to gain a little bit on those drivers who are running back there in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth position. They'd like to pull away if they possibly could, and the only way they can do that is to work together, not race with each other out there side by side, because when one car pulls down, as we're seeing right there, it slows them all down. Let's go back to the trenches. Here's a report from Mike Joy. Buddy Ferret, that 3,700-pound car gets real heavy when you have to push it the whole length of pit road. What happened? Well, not only do we have a, a fast pit crew changing tires, I think we could win the 100-yard dash. Uh, no, we're... You know, when you get behind, we had a had a vibration of transmission and it vibrated a bolt off of something in the shifter. So we're having to start in high gear and, and uh, Joe was going to pit in front of Bobby and Bobby kind of got up behind him. Instead of darting down the pit road, he went on around and ran out of gas right here on the front straightaway. So, uh, you know, it's just starting our day. Uh, just hopefully we can hang on and uh, finish and finish up so we can have a race car at the end of the race. Joe's doing a good job. The car really runs strong. When it's running, we got a super motor in the car, and it's a real the team effort's uh, still going good. You've got a computer here in your pit, so you don't know when you're going to be out of gas or not. There's no fuel gauges in these cars. We can't blame it on the computer because because uh, my computer operator just came up to me five laps prior and said you're going to run out of gas. <laughs> so I didn't believe him, but uh, I tell you one thing, I'm going to believe in the computer from now on. I'm going to pit when he tells me to pit. Let's go to Larry Dover. Mike, we commented earlier that Bobby Allison was running on the ragged edge, and things are so bad, they're thinking about taking some drastic measures to change the chassis and the feel of the race car. There's a heavy coil spring down in the ground, and here are a couple of shock absorbers that may be destined to go on the front end. That'll take two or three minutes all together, and probably three individual pit stops. Not something you do under the green flag. That's the reason why, during the last pit stop under the green flag, they made no chassis adjustment. They're hoping for a yellow. They'll come in three times and maybe make the changes that they need. Ken Flyer. There are the leaders. There's Earnhardt in front. Bodine is in second. Kelly Yarbrough is third. And right there in fourth is Richard Petty. What is his strategy in this race? You know, you've got to be around at the end of the race in order to win the thing. And a lot of times, the, these boys that we're talking about, the, the veterans will run up front and sort of feel things out, and then they'll back up in the pack and run there for the rest of the race and, you know, not really show their true colors till the end of the race. So, uh, especially running a racetrack like this. Behind Richard Petty in fourth is Neil Bonnet in fifth, and then in sixth, it is the car of Darrell Waltrip with seven spot Bill Elliott. We are now at 114 laps complete. 114 down, 74 to go. Ken, not long ago, those front two cars, they learned hard to jump their dime, were running about uh, three se almost three seconds ahead of that uh, pack behind them. But now with Cale Yarborough moving up to third place, he's proven he's one of the fastest cars here today. They're closing in. One and six, ten seconds now between the second place car, 88 Bodine, and number 28 right there, Cale Yarborough, who, as we saw at Michigan, you never can count out of these things. He just keeps coming back. And there in fourth is the great Richard Petty. <laughs> You can hear Kale as he goes into the turns and his, uh, well, I guess the vibration of his voice. The sound of a Martian? No, the sound of Kale Yarborough going through the first and second turn of the fastest race track in the world, the Alabama International Motor Speedway. From three seconds down, Kale Yarborough has gone up to three car lengths down to the two leaders, Dale Earnhardt. Jeff Bodine here in our live CBS coverage of the Talladega 500. The 15th annual coming down to another typical Talladega finish. 
Thus far, we've had 29 lead changes among eight drivers. And here you see Yarborough under rather foreboding skies closing on those leaders. Now, there are the cars in the front position. Waltrip, and in second, Bouchard in third, Bonnet, Gant, Ricky Rush, still very much up in the hunt. This was after 100 laps. Going back to the ninth position was Bobby Allison then with David Pearson in 10th, followed by Elliott, Earnhardt, Bodine. That pretty much was the lead lap, and there was the rest of the field. That was at 100 laps. Cars still running in the race. We've had 15 cars retired. Battle for the lead. And it is a tough one as Yarborough begins to make his move. And Earnhardt does not want to relinquish. Back again goes Earnhardt on the outside. What a battle for the lead. Here they come down toward the trioval in front of the pit area. That is the battle for second, and Earnhardt is going to go for first. Bodine has pulled into first. Earnhardt is in second. Taylor Yarborough in third. Meanwhile, let's take a look at Bill Elliott's windshield. He's running back in the seventh position. Doesn't look good, Ned. Ned, a moment ago, we saw a crack in the right uh, hand side of it, but now there, you can see there are two cracks on the right side. That's the one we saw earlier, but now there are four cracks on the left side. That should become a problem for Bill Elliott. Meanwhile, the battle stays up front. A quick report in the pits. Here's Larry Newber. Go to Mike Joy at this time. Ernie, Ernie Elliott, that crack in the windshield from our CBS race cam in your brother's car looks to be getting larger. What's the story there? Well, we just had a report. I've got a guy, I've sent a guy down there now to kind of monitor it and see how bad the crack is. And we're just going to try to, we've already made the preparations to change the windshield, so right now we're just going to monitor the situation on your camera, and if it gets any worse, you know, if it gets to the point that we feel like it's unsafe, then we'll go ahead and change it. But right now, we're just going to try to wait on a caution to make a change. How long should it take you to change it if you need to? Oh, under a caution, we can change it, you know, easily without losing a lap. It usually takes about a minute and a half to change a windshield. Let's get out of Larry Newber. Mike, the best time to talk to the crew chief of a Grand National stock car is when his car is leading, right, Dale Bryant? <laughs> well, that's the better time to talk to him. And uh, right now, we are leading, I think. And uh, we're just buying their time. We got a lap down, but we beat them back on the yellow flag. And, now we're back in contention, so everyone in the field is happy. Did Daryl, did uh, you have any conversation with uh, Jeff Bodine following that race back to the stripe? Well, I think what happened going in one, and I started hollering to him to try to beat him back in any way possible. That's the only way you can do it on a track like this. Because the cars are so equal that one car just can't run off and leave one, so you have to draft by him, and that's where you get your last back. You're right there. Jeff Bodine has just lost the lead to Richard Petty. Well, but we're still in contention. We're still in contention. They're side by side. Good racing up top, Ken and Ned. Richard Petty has taken the lead. Now he's losing it again to Jeff Bodine. Petty, for the first time, showing the authority of car number 43. And he and Bodine are going at it wheel and wheel, and right behind them is Neil Bonnet. And Ken, we've talked about the Ford being three up front. Now, now we have three Pontiacs that are running for a second and third. Those Pontiacs had to fight their way into this. The Buicks and the Pontiacs have been... And now they're three wide. Look at Earnhardt on the inside. Bodine in the middle. Now up on the outside, Teddy takes the lead, and Neil Bonner comes with him. There is Darrell Waldrop and then Kelly Yarbrough on that group. One thing that Dale Earnhardt does not lack, and that is nerve. If he wants to make a move, he sees a hole, he goes for it. Yarbrough in six, going for fifth. Right in front of him, number 11, Darrell Waldrop, the defending national champion, defending winner of the Talladega 500. 200 miles an hour down into turn number three. Yarborough puts it right up on the side of the barn. There is Kathy Bodine working on. Keeping track of the time on car number 88, which now finds itself fighting off Darrell Waltrip. And you can see her sort of urging him on to Ken as he can find her position. He's fourth. Bonnet making a move for the lead. There is Petty in third, Bodine in fourth. And Bonnet just squeezed down to the inside. Moved that steering wheel just a tickle as he went after car number 15, Earnhardt, and then decided to slip in and draft him down the back straightaway. Now, here's the place to pass. Going to the three. Will he take the shot? It's been a quick draw finish time after time, and it looks like another high noon shootout is on its way at Tullinger, Alabama. Canadian Open later this afternoon here on CBS. Earnhardt in front, Bonnet in second, and the giant, Richard Petty in third. For the fans who might have tuned in late, Neil Bonner.
Bonnie, of course, is not in his regular car. He had an accident on the second lap of this race when the engine blew in his regular car number 75. This is the car that Tim Richland qualified and started the race in. Of course, we saw Tim uh, had a problem with his eye, got something in it. Bonnie has been in the car ever since and has never sat down in that race car before, but has been a contender all afternoon. And that's the mark of real professionalism. Two-thirds of the race gone. We're 126 laps in. 62 laps to go, and Neil Bonnet is going for first place. Bonnet goes in front. Petty drops into second. Earnhardt falls to third. Bodine is in fourth. Working back there, Kaylee Arborough. He's made up a lap. Fought his way back into it. Right now, the fifth position is still at Darrell Walters, car number 11. Whatever was dragging in the car three was close situation. That's gone away. Back there in six. It is Jarborough, and in seventh, as they sweep across the line, is Harry Gant, with the eighth position belonging to Bill Elliott. Petty has been able to maintain almost for a lap, staying down on the inside. The other's running in a, in a straight line by themselves, but he's able to stay right up there and in contention the inside of Dale Earnhardt. Here comes Waltrip. Look at Waltrip just mow them down now. Darrell Waltrip, for the first time, is letting car number 11 loose. Waltrip squeezes in the third Puts Petty back to fourth. Petty trying for his 197th win. Wild racing up for the banking for a moment. There's Petty back under Yarborough. He's right up there beside Jeff Bodine as they come back into the trioval. You can see the cars wander a little. They're better than 195 miles an hour right there. Bonnet in first. Turnhart in second. Richard Petty is attacking again on Darrell Waltrip, seeking his 198th win. Petty in fourth. Let's get a report from his pits. Richard Petty scored his 197th career win right here in May. Larry Pollard, we've not seen Richard at the front of the pack all day. All of a sudden, here he is. Was the car not right at the start of the race, or has he been biding his time? Well, it was probably pretty close, but the problem was, uh, Mike, all week long, we've had trouble running up front with the Monte Carlo and stuff. And I think now we've got the car dialed into where we want, and he wants to see if it's comfortable and see if he can run up front at the end. So he wanted to go into the lead for a bit if he could and then wait for the end now. So we'll ride it out from here on. So there's a chance now that he's been up front, he may fall back a bit and kind of hold his horses? Sure, yeah. We're going to just probably conserve now and then and see what the end brings. Now that we know we can run up front. Let's go to Larry Newber with Bud Moore. Bud Moore, Dale Earnhardt's crew chief. You're running up front. Are you exactly where you want to be at this point in the race, Bud? Well, yeah. We need to stay up there so we can run cool and stay out front as much as possible. Uh, we're fixing to make a pit stop now, and we'll have one more stop after this, and then uh, we hope everything goes well. I noticed you dispatched a crew member down to the Jeff Bodine area to coordinate stops with them. Well, we're just going to stop at the same time, so that's the way we're working it right now, so we don't get left up there by ourselves. Bud Moore, ready to go back to work over the pit wall. Bodine slightly overshot us in Carnival 88. He's coming back on the track. And Tim, they chose to change left side tires on his car. We'll see what the others do when we come back. Time to go back on pit road. Next to last in the Talladega 500 for 83. We're back with you live at Talladega, Alabama next Sunday. It's a dandy here on CBS, a battle of two super featherweights. Undefeated, Hector Macho Camacho takes on Rafael Bazooka Limon in a 12-round loud bout. And the Cowboys are at it. Beer wrestling, calf roping, bull riding at the Calgary Stampede next weekend, CBS Sports Sunday, beginning at 4 Eastern. Here in the Talladega 500, 132 of the 188 laps have been completed. And Darrell Waltrip is in front. Neil Bonnet driving the 27 is in second. We've just had our 16th retiree from the race. And that was David Pearson from Spartanburg, South Carolina, having some sort of mechanical problems with his car. For David, the second half winner on all Grand National races on the second of the And he's never won this race. He's come in second. He's done in the fall. But again, the Talladega 500 eludes the Silver Fox. There's your leader, Walter. Ken, when we went away for the commercial break, Dale Earnhardt was out front, but he has since made a pit stop. He made a very good pit stop. He's running about six seconds in front of the leader. Not that much being a lap down. Those cars that we're seeing on the screen will be coming in before long. Dick Brooks is in the pits right now getting his service. So pit stops are again the order of the race. We have 12 cars running in the lead lap. 12 automobiles now in the lead lap as the race begins to drain. And out in front remains Waltrip at this moment. He's been there for three laps. Darrell Waltrip in front. Neil Bonnet, who picked up a ride after 
Dr. Tim Richmond had something in his eye. Here is Kale Yarbrough coming in, and here comes number seven back in another time, Kyle Petty locking up the break. He slides to the stop. Here's Mike Joy. Richard Petty brings his Pontiac on to pit road for routine service. You see a hole developing in the windshield right in front of Petty's field of vision as they service the left side tires. Car still up on the jack as they dump in the second can of gasoline. It'll be a routine pit stop for Richard. Down to Larry Newber. Anything but a routine pit stop for the Kyle Petty, Mike Beam crew chief crew as Kyle Petty, who has been fighting the flu for the last just about 70 or 80 laps, has gotten out of the car. Terry Labonte has gotten in. Terry Labonte has got his own helmet on. That was a concern earlier. The radio hookup just didn't match, and they had to jury rig the helmet. Now the steering wheel has been removed. They're adjusting the length of all the devices inside the race car, because as we reported to you earlier, Kyle is significantly taller than Terry Labonte. But Terry Labonte jumps into the number seven car of Kyle Petty and rejoins the fray. Ken, we speculated earlier that they might not make that change under the green flag. They didn't want to, and we see Kyle Petty there now getting a little oxygen, something to drink, but I guess they had no choice but to make that stop a costly one because it took extra time during this green flag pit stop. Remember, the cockpit temperature stays 135, 140 degrees in these cars, and if you don't feel well to start, you sure won't feel well when it's over. Here's Darrell Walters, who was leading. He's coming into the pit. Schedule stop for him, and most of them have been making left side tire changes. The last time they stopped, they made right side tire changes. And on this high bank racetrack, there's almost as much pressure on the left side as there is on the right side. Yeah, I was just thinking about what I said about not feeling well when you start, you won't feel well when it's over. Harry Gant one time told me, let's go to Mike Joy. Junior Johnson keeps the car out well away from the pit wall. He had that board almost in the middle of pit road. That's a sure sign of a left side tire stop. Doug Richard hits the wrench on the front wheel. Gas waiting for Henry Bentley to drop that second can in. And there goes Walter. Harry Gant one time told me that the best way to cure a cold is to go out and run in a race car for a couple of hours. There's Kyle Petty. Didn't work for Kyle Petty. Well, I, I have known race cars to be good medicine. I have gone into a race with a flu or a bad cold or something like that. But, uh, and come out of the race feeling good. Now there he sees a windshield in Bill Elliott's car, and now he's taken a hit as well down below. You see a bullet hole there on the bottom side as he took some piece of small debris. That windshield begins to look real serious. They taped up some of it. The question is, will it stay? He's staying right up in the lead lap at the present time. Yes, he is. One of his crew members is, uh, is looking at one of our CBS monitors just to see how bad it is because with him zipping around out there at almost 200 miles an hour, they can't tell how bad that windshield is. So they have him down there uh, taking a look at it, hoping for a problem that they might be able to change it during the caution. And here we have a battle uh, between Jeff Bodine and Neil Bunn. The 27 car bonnet is being shown as the leader. They are now in the process of making pit stops. They have reported car number three in second place, which would be a little because Ricky Rudd has just pulled in as well. I believe the majority of the leaders have all come on pit road, and we'll bring you back up to date as who the top ones are. 12 cars running in the lead lap with 138 laps complete. Neil Bonnet reported up in front. Unofficially, they're saying Bobby Allison in second. Bobby has yet to make his pit stop. He's been running a few laps longer than any of the other cars. Five the last time. Yes, he did. He gets an exceptionally good gas mileage on that car. Robert Yates, the engine builder on it, knows how to set it up, knows how to adjust that car ready so he gets that good mileage. All right, we're getting down toward the finish. 138 laps are now complete in the Talladega 500. The finish coming up short. with you live at Talladega, Alabama for the 15th annual Talladega 500 leader is now coming back on the track. He's just been in for fuel. That's Neil Bonnet driving the Tim Richmond 27. The leader is now number 22, Bobby Allison. Second place has been a war. Richard Petty is in third and dropping off the pace is car number 28. The Cale Yarborough car, which is right there a moment ago, something seems to be amiss on car number 28. In fact, he is back on pit road. Unscheduled pit stop for Taylor Yarborough. 
going into the garage area. Cleo Yarborough, who really put up a valiant effort here today, Ken, coming from a lap down two different times, and has led this race quite often, but now it looks like it's going to be all for him today. Cracked windshield, as you see, the beginning to develop, but you can see as the car staggers in that there's a lot more than windshield problems. Here's a report from Mike Joy coming up as we see Cale Yarborough going back into the garage area. And let's go to Mike Neil Joy. Just, Neil Botta just made a good pit stop. Tim Richmond, you're a heck of a cheerleader. Well, I'm a cheerleader. We handed him some water and, uh, and took one of the tires. and He did an excellent job coming into the pits, an excellent job going out. And the Blue Max Old Milwaukee crew did a good job getting him out. The reason we left him out so long and took a chance, that just means a lot less fuel we have to put in when he comes back in for the last stop. Looks like you're going to watch this one from the sideline. Well, whatever Tim Brewer wants. You know, he's the boss. If it costs us something, I'm not going to get in the car. If it don't cost anything, I'll probably get back in. But the way it looks, I'm not. I'm going to stay out here. Back up there. I don't there. like it here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy that really likes racing. I mean, really likes racing. Tim Richmond, who's on the sidelines. There's the leader now. Bobby Allison in the number 22 has taken over in first place. And he has a pretty healthy lead right now. They're showing car number 27 is backed up into second spot after his quick pit stop then. Well, he has a good second group. Uh, Bobby Allison has a good healthy lead as a result of not having made his pit stop yet. That's third place, number 15, Earnhardt. And they're reporting Richard Petty is in the fourth place, number 43, with a fifth spot going to, to uh, Bill Elliott in car number nine. As to the circumstances around Bouchard, I question if he's going to lap down. We'll see in a moment. Waiting for a report from Cale Yarborough's story. Wait, 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 heartbreaker for him. And getting a word from him shortly. Cale really gave it a valiant effort today. As Ned Jarrett pointed out, he had to do some making up to do, and he made it up. He came from a lap back and fought his way into the lead. Bobby Allison, who had a dismal qualifying day, didn't make it the first day at all, came back the second day, and then was relegated to 24th position. He's trying to tie Cale Yarborough for the all-time overall win list. He has 76 overall wins. Yarborough has 77. Now there you see number 27 sneaking alongside Richard Petty. That is Neil Bonnet driving the Richmond car. They are showing Bouchard a lap down. And there is Bill Elliott's car still hanging tough in fifth position. It looks like that windshield, which still the left front, is not uh, not getting any work for it yet. Here's Bobby Allison in the pit. Car number 22, Bobby Allison. They schedule stop for him. They're changing left side tires on his car, as they did on some, most of the other front runners during this schedule pit stop. Now, they got about 40-some-odd uh, laps to go, Ken. They won't be able to go the rest of the distance here. They'll have to make at least one more pit stop for gasoline. He came into today's race with over a 200-point advantage over second-place Darrell Walker. That battle is expected to continue to stay hot all the way down to the finish. Well, Bobby Allison went uh, two laps longer than did Neil Bonnet. Allison went 39 laps on this uh, run, where Neil Bonnet went 37. Richard Petty was the next closest at 34 laps. Bobby Allison, who leads in the NASCAR Grand National standings by 202 points over Darrell Waltrip, is back on the track as we move down in the Talladega 500 to the last pit stop. One more to go for fuel. CBS Sports Live coverage of the Talladega 500 will continue after this word from your local station. Cracks continue to strain across the windshield of car number 47. The car of Ron Bouchard and a consultation flag has just been given to him. Here's a quick report from Larry Newber with Cale Yarbrough. Cale Yarbrough, it's become traditional on these CBS races. We talk to you at the beginning because you're usually up front. We talk to you at the end of the race. Well, it's not quite the end of the race this time. Well, no, we, uh, I guess we spun the bearings or something. Uh, I smelled a uh, funny smell uh, last couple laps. And uh, I thought it was, I was hoping it was somebody else, but it was me. But uh, the car ran real well while we was running. These things just happened. Cal, it's very warm, at least up and down pit road today. How was it in the cockpit? Well, it was pretty warm, but uh, it was a little bit overcast. It could have been a whole lot worse, but uh, we, we could have made it. Since the crash on lap number two, the race has been relatively incident-free. Track appears to be in good condition from down here. Is it also that way in the car? Yeah, the track's in good condition. Uh, it's a little bit slick, but... Uh, the race was going super good. Uh, everybody, there's still a lot of strong cars in the race, but we were very strong. Uh, when we wanted to go this run, I felt like I could go, but I know you got to be around at the end to win, and I was just trying to be around, but uh, we won't be here today.
Cal, Cal, quickly, you've been with the leaders most of the day. Who looks strong to you? I think Earnhardt looks the strongest right now. He's running, uh, running off a bit. Uh, if he goes all day, he'll be hard to beat. Dale Earnhardt, that's Cal Yarbrough's pick. And currently, Earnhardt is third. There's your leader, Bonnet, again. The Pontiac of Richard Petty now running second. The Ford of Earnhardt is back to third spot. Waltrip is in fourth. Last car in there for a moment. He's dropped back to lap car. The fifth spot is Bill Elliott in the number nine. There's Elliott looking out over the front four. Windshield badly beaten up, but he's still very much in it, and he doesn't want to stop whatever he does under green. Heavy, heavy clouds off one and two. Beginning to look very ominous there off the first and second turn. That could be the factor that decides this thing. That's why there's such a charge up in front, and right now, Richard Petty carries the day into the first turn. Bonnet almost in the sight of Earnhardt. He got very close to him. In fact, I believe they did rub fenders, but he, that's not going to let him stop him from coming back up there again. Now, if it should rain, we are better than halfway. I am sure they would put them under a red flag, bring all the cars down. They're not allowed to work on them. The drivers would get their only respite that they can get in the event put it on a red flag, but, or they could stop the race right there. It depends upon how serious and how severe the shower conditions are. Here's Mike Joy. They, they have replaced the windshield in Ron Bouchard's car, the one they just put in. It looks like they may have cracked it getting it in the car on the right side. He doesn't have to look through that side of the windshield, so perhaps they can live with this one. They're taping it up in place of the molding that's usually on there to make sure it stays in place. There are also retainer clips. They're fueling the car while it's in here to take advantage of the pit stop, and then they'll send the 1981 winner of this race back out. The man with the headset on there was Mr. Beatty from Connecticut, who owns that car in the school bus business some school bus. Here's Petty in front. Earnhardt coming to second. Earnhardt coming to the lead and Bonnet comes with him. Gives you some idea of the speed net as they thrust those cars onto the bottom of turn number three. Actually, Earnhardt just sucked Neil Bonnet right past Richard Petty. There wasn't anything Petty could do about it. Just look over and wave and say, I'll try to get you back in a little bit. Franklin, Tennessee's Darrell Waltrip lying fourth. And if you want to talk about speed, take a look at this. That third place car remains Petty. The fourth place car, that is Walton, deployed in fifth, is Bill Elliott. Then in the sixth position is car number three. He's dropped back, and coming up is 33, Harry Gant. Gant is up in the sixth position this time. Here's the back end of that lead pack. We still have 10 cars in the lead lap, even though they're pitting under caution. Remember, one second on pit road, 300 feet in the track. It tells you just a little bit about the excellence of these teams when they make pit stops. They and really keep the field together. They certainly do. The fact that they've made three green flag pit stops now since they've had a caution, it's remarkable that they're still running this close together. Elliott lies fifth. Last 153 laps are now complete. There are 35 to go. Can Earnhardt hold on and win it? Will Bonnet take it in a borrowed car? Can Richard Petty win number 198 in his quest for 200 Grand National wins? Or will this man, Bill Elliott, with our second CBS onboard camera, be the fifth different driver to win his first Grand National race at this awesome 2.6 mile racing facility? Four complete. Petty going to the outside. And all of those drivers have been told on the radio that there is weather building up off the first and second turn and to get with the program right now. There you see Gant. He's come into sixth position in the Hal Nina Burr Reynolds car, and that one's beginning to roll. Gant has pulled up. He's been way on the back end of the tail lap, and now he's up in the sixth. And then this looks like it could be the most dramatic finish we've ever had at Talladega. It could be. All of those cars seem so very evenly matched. We've seen them switch positions back and forth, but no one has had any distinct advantage all afternoon. Benny Parsons has retired. Benny Parsons, who has never won this race, is car number 55. At lap 153, has gone back behind the wall. They have just announced that Parsons will not come back out. That is the 18th retiree. 
Pearson, Yarborough, Parsons, right in a row. The 16th, 17th, and 18th drivers to come out of this race. All the superpowers of racing see their problems here. Racing against time and against those clouds that you see off the first and second turn. And you can bet your bottom dollar that they see those as they go into the turn camp. They know that there's a possibility that a tire could come, so they want to be right up front, ready to make the move in case that caution should come out. Well, that's at least a crash water, and it could be a hog swallower over there off the first and second turn, Ned. Here is 15 Earnhardt determined to hold on to the lead. Bonnet just as determined to give Tim Richmond something to cheer about today and take that car number 27 to victory lane for the second straight week. Remarkable win a week ago in Pocono, Pennsylvania for Tim Richmond in this car. Again, as we pointed out to you, Tim Richmond had an eye injury early in the race and his relief has been Neil Bonnet who was in a crash on the very top of the race. In the second lap, we had six cars eliminated when Neil Bonnet lost an engine. The cars took evasive action struck the wall inside, outside each other. It took Grant Adcox out of the race and several others. I think Bill Elliott here could be a sleeper for us today. He's been right there, run, running in the top five most of the day, biding his time, looking at those tracks on his windshield, but they don't seem to be getting much worse for him right now. And uh, he uh, might be just sitting there waiting, have a little bit left. He's uh, sort of a sly character, you know. He's learned uh, a lot in his uh, relatively few years in this business. This is his seventh year here in the Talladega 500 for Bill Elliott. Again, he's never won, but he's there, and he works just outside. Remember, he set outside pole, and the outside pole position has won this race five times. Every other driver has come from a different position. No one has come from one position more than once. We'll be back with more on that Talladega 500 in a moment. The Wall Street Journal is written for busy people. It doesn't waste your time with what you don't want to know. 28 and a half laps remain in the 15th annual $373,000 Talladega 500. As we see Earnhardt in first, Bonnet in second, going in third, it is Darrell Waltrip. There's the rookie battle, and right now Sterling Marlin has been running in 17th, has just pitted and come back out net. And now Bobby Hillen Jr. is uh, the top-running rookie. He's running in 13th position. So a good battle there between the rookie drivers. And, you know, being in the top 20 in this field is uh, certainly not something to be excused at. Midland, Texas youngster having a very good day here. Bobby Hillen and Sterling Marlin, still those rookies out here fighting for the honors of being the number one freshman. For being number one at Talladega, where no man has ever won it twice except that man, number 11, Darrell Walter. It is Earnhardt in front, Bonnet in second, and there is Bill Elliott putting the move on Richard Petty to take over fourth position. Bill Elliott, as the time runs out and the clouds continue to build up, the Thunderheads off the first and second turn. Petty goes back by him. Petty wants no part of that. There are your leaders. Earnhardt first, Bonnet second, going third. Bobby Allison, and he is about two-thirds of a lap down to the eight cars running in this lead track. And we see Big Brooks down on the inside of the screen, currently running at about fifth position there. Of course, he's at least one lap down, but he's right up to speed with the rest of the leaders. That's like right in there with him, and some of the cars have been using him as a drafting piece to try to move farther up. Well, it will be liquid of one substance or another that will decide this race. There will be one more fuel stop. There could be one serious rain stop. Eight cars running in the lead bundle. Here they come. The 163. And the leader is in. Earnhardt elects the gamble. He comes in. Here's Larry Newman. Dale Earnhardt, one of those who has never won this race, this whole very competitive race. Immediate attention to the right side or the starboard side of the race car. Remember, we've got less than 30 laps to go in this race. They don't have to fill the tank up all the way. No attention whatsoever to the left hand side. Right tires only, and maybe about three quarters of a tank of fuel. We'll see. Super pit stop again, 12 and 4 tenths seconds the time that he was actually stopped. He made a good approach to the pit. He came in quick. He's getting out quick. That was a very good pit stop for Dale Earnhardt. Bonnet in first. In second is Waltrip. Here is Elliott trying to go underneath Petty again. It has been at the last pit stop where Elliott seems to have had his problems. There he is Gant. The bandit comes 
down to pit road. Harry Gann on the Taylorsville, North Carolina, Travis Carter crew ready for car number 33. Key player late in the going, something to miss. He either overshot his pit, I believe he did, he overshot his pit, now he's going to have to back up. You talk about a costly oh, pit stop. This that is, is going to cost him any chance. Unless there is a caution, they're rolling him back behind Bobby Allison. Now they're bringing him back in. Bad break for Gap. Very tough break. It, I don't know if he just had a mental lapse and went by, or if something uh, was wrong with the car that wouldn't let him to lock down. up. No, it didn't. So, but of course, uh, Bobby Allison was Leaders. right there when he came into the pit, so it might have blocked his view as to where his pit was. Exactly. You can see that time running away. It's so easy to get mesmerized in this track at 200 miles an hour. Every driver talks about it. You may have seen it there. We're 27 in front, Bond is first, Walker second, Petty third. Again, we saw Bobby Allison uh, in the pit. He's still there. They changed the windshield on his car, at least worked on it. Lap down, Allison. Allison goes a lap down. Bad break for Bobby. Bobby Allison seeking that 77th win. He's staying in the point battle, but not up here to be a winner in this one. Here's the man that is, Bill Elliott, car number nine, and it is a tough time as the windshields begin to get clouded with the oil, the residue from the track. But the issue is, can Elliott's crew keep it gathered up, keep their cool, get him out, and keep him in this hunt for first place? There you see Bonnet first, in pursuit in second is Darrell Waltrip, then comes Richard Petty, and Bill Elliott. Elliott has never won a race, and there's a bit of a shattered windshield. That was Allison. I think some of that may have happened when they threw it over their left shoulder. Yeah, I don't think it was in that condition <laughs> when it was in the car, but I'm sure it was pretty bad or they wouldn't have taken it out. We haven't been keeping up with speed in this race because of that very long caution. The average is up to 167 miles an hour. The average for this race is 174 miles per hour. My running car is 78 in the near car. And the overall average, of course, is Buddy Baker at 177 miles per hour is the record for 500 miles at Daytona. Right now, it's just a plain old shootout decision here. Well, even though the average speed is down some again, they are continuously turning left speed from 197, 198 miles an hour, even this late in the race. Now, uh, Elliott is pitting. Fourth place car, Bill Elliott is on pit, uh, is on pit road, and what has been pit, is locking up a break. Ricky Wright moves up. Let's go to Mike Joy. They're servicing left side tires on Bill Elliott's car. You see the crack of the windshield as they wash it. It does not look to be too severe. It does not appear to be hampering his vision too much. They want to get every drop of gas in because the Fords don't get quite as good gas mileage as the GM car. He's away. Petty moving out in front of Bill Elliott as they come back on the track. That's their last stop. 167 laps are complete. 21 to go. When will these two come in? Should be within the next lap. Number 11, Walter first. 27, Bonnet in second. Ricky Rudd moves up to third. But remember the last time, Neil Bonnet went longer than anyone else except for Bobby Allison. Of course, Bobby Allison has already been in because of his windshield problem. So Bonnet should have another uh, five or six laps before he will have to go. down by Bobby Allison. Allison has two down from his empty stick. 18 cars have retired. The last of the pit stops taking place as they try to gather up the field to come down for it. The sky continues to get grayer. Turn one and two area. Walter staying in front. Darrell Walter had a t-shirt on. They used to advertise this race as 13 races, 13 faces. He had a t-shirt he wore earlier this week that said, 14 races, 13 faces. I'm sorry about that. I'm sure that he'd like to add his name or the right. right. there. Buddy Arrington getting left out of turn two. Well, the junior Johnson crew, there's Kyle Petty back in again, and of course we have a different driver, Terry Labonte, now in the, in the car. Terry Labonte has taken over for a very ill Kyle Petty. Started the race with a fever, and the race didn't cure him. who was uh, very aggressive in the early part, still, of course, running very hard, but seems to be content running their own uh, Darrell Walker at this point. And you must remember that Bonnet was involved in a 190-mile-an-hour six-car crash at the very beginning. His engine blew, he spun across the track, five other cars were eliminated, 
casually stepped away from the machine, walked down Tim Road, and then Tim Richmond was in trouble, went right back to the war. No problem at all for him. Now there's Mark Martin running right behind Tim Richmond. He's going to lap down. And here's Bill Elliott back into pit. This is an unscheduled uh -huh. pit stop for Bill Elliott. Mike Joy. An unscheduled stop this one, Ned. They were just in for right side tires. They found they had to put left ones on. He'll almost go a lap down, and this could put him out of contention. Bad break for Elliott. Still seeking that first win. Here come the leaders charging down out of the fourth turn as Elliott comes back on the track directly here in front of us at the start finish line. And here come your leaders through the trioval. They are headed for the start line. Elliott apparently is not going to lose a lap here. He's able to get in and get out. Of course, they would be a lap down to Darrell Waltrip and Neil Bonnet, who have not stopped. They have not come in. They are pretty much in a lap unto themselves now. Ricky Rudd is shown in third. Teddy is in fourth. Calling Elliott fifth. Question that for just a moment and see. That break for Gann has put him back. Probably is right. Darrell Waltrip. There you see the laps he has led. No one leads for very long. Only once was this race dominated. That was back in 1970 when Pete Hamilton just, just about ran away. And now Waltrip is preparing to pit. Leader is coming in. We have a smoker going down into turn number one, which might bring out a caution. We'll see what will happen here. Car 17. Sterling Marlin. That's the rookie. But there is no caution appearing on the track. Here's Mike Joy. Darrell Waltrip is in for what he hopes will be his last pit stop. They're going to the right side of the car, looking at the tires. They're not going to change them. They're just adding fuel to get the last drop in and send him on his way. Different piece of strategy there, Ken. Only taking on gas. Junior Johnson going to the big gamble. There's 172 laps complete. There are 16 to go. No change of rubber. Now, will this force the hand of uh, Neil Bonnet and Tim Brewer and the crew on the car number 27? Will they just uh, take on gasoline? He's got to stop Here before too long. You would think they would have to, Ned. Just, just come in if they want a shot at that number 11. Now, normally, they can change tires as quickly as they can put in a full load of fuel, sometimes quicker. But here's Ricky Rudd, who had moved up into second place, coming in for his stop. We'll see what he does. Oh, but they did not take on a full load of fuel this time. Less than half a tank. Sure, that's all they need. Mike Joy. Jeff Hammond, you took the tires over the wall, but you didn't change them. Well, we decided we'd take a real quick look at them. If they look like they go all the way, we're going to let him go. But if they look like they're a little close, we're going to change it. So we just be prepared to go both ways. How much of a gamble is that? Well, so far, what tire where we've seen, we're going to be plenty safe. You know, we just want to take, really make them sure of it. But uh, otherwise, we've been checking the tire engineers all day long and keeping up with what our tires have been doing on the other green flag stops. And we look like we're in good shape. So Walter will race on used tires against the fresh ones of the other cars in the lead lap. Let's go to Larry Newber. Some interesting development here in the Neil Bonnet pit area. Tim Richmond, Tim Brewer, as well as the car owner, they've all gotten together. They're thinking about staying out as long as they possibly can. The wind has picked up significantly in the last 60 seconds. They think it's going to rain here at Talladega within about a minute and a half or maybe two minutes. They may stretch Bonnet as far as they possibly can because of the weather moving in. He's ready to lap Mark Martin. There are 15 laps remaining. 15 to go. Waltrip has not won a super speedway race since Rockingham last fall. He has four wins to his credit this year, but they have all been on short track. The gamblers have all put their hands on the table. The question is, who's going to call? We'll be back in a moment for the decision. With 12 laps to go, Neil Bonnet, that car just coming off pit road, hit it, and he had trouble getting started. And there goes the leader, Ricky Rudd, in car number three, is leading this race, Darrell Walker, bearing down on it. He was only in the pit six and a half seconds. Take Walter takes the lead. Walter back in front, and Earnhardt is there, and we have three cars after all these pit stops gathered up for the lead. Now let me give you the leaders. We have 177 laps complete, 11 to go, Ned. The leader for the moment is Earnhardt. In second, it's about a dead heat. Earnhardt has the advantage slightly over Ricky Rudd in the... Number 11, uh, that is number 11, Walter for the lead. Earnhardt in second by just a whisker over car number three, Ricky Rudd in the third position. And Neil Bonnet has some catching up to do. He might have stretched it a little too long because they apparently ran out of gas. Once they got the fuel in, they had to push him off down pit road, cost him an extra four or five seconds. But he has a lot of catching up to do. Leader, Walter. Here's Ricky Rudd back in it another time. Earnhardt. That is Joe Rutland now being 
showing a lap down car number 98 a little further back. And there are only 10 laps to go. Here's Larry Newman. Tim Richmond standing by watching Neil Bonnet, his relief driver. Tim, you guys cut it just a little too short on fuel. Right, it was running and coming in, and right when he stopped, it threw the fuel away from the pickup, and it sputtered enough to where he couldn't leave the pits under all power, and it slowed us down, and uh, we're behind right now, and there's only 10 laps to go. Let me see, here he comes. He's checking him right now. But I don't, Ricky Rudd looks like he just ran out of fuel, but I don't know. It, it's going to be... Uh, you know, the car's tough enough, we just have a little, a little bit of luck and catch that draft and run him down, he'll get it. Tim, you and Raymond were timing him very closely just before he pitted. Do you think he is faster than the other cars on the track when he's outside the draft? When he was by himself, uh, he was faster than Daryl was when Daryl and Bobby uh, Allison was drafting. So, you know, the Milwaukee Pontiac's running good. It's just, you know, if we've got enough time to get there, I don't know. Well, Mike Petroy is at the other end of the pit row. Another one of the stories we're watching is that of Ricky Rudd. Ricky Rudd just slowed down. Richard Childers, what's the matter? Something happened to the ignition, he said. It just cut off on It's a heck of a thing for 10 laps to go. That's right. The top three, as we see Ricky Rudd slowly coming back in after that great effort he's performed today. Waltrip first. Earnhardt in second. And the third position right now is car number 27, Neil Bonnet. Car that was started by Tim Richmond. In fourth, Richard Petty. And in fifth is Bodine, and Bodine is running a lap down, and he is in a real dogfight with Harry Gant. They're fighting for fifth position, 88 to 33. Now, Kent, the car number 11, Darrell Walter, did not take on tires. Dale Earnhardt did, and yet he's right there with him. That's an indication that those new tires have helped him to run faster since he came back out there. He is, does he have a little bit left that he might be able to draft past uh, Darrell Walter on that last lap as a result of being able to stick down on the inside of the track a little bit better. Uh, seventh place car is Richard Brooks. Eighth is Bill Elliott. Time is running out. 181 laps completed. That's 188 laps. $373,000 shootout. Here you see Walter first. And then you wonder how much of a part these cars that are a lap down. There's Bobby Allison running right there in the third position. However, he's uh, at least two laps down. He's still on the win. Okay. But he could play a part in the role of the outcome of this race. He sure could. And this is going to keep him up in that point battle. There are the two that look like they're going to decide it. As happened so many times, that last fuel top makes for great separation out here. And we have the third place car, number 27, really looking up from under. He's a long way back if you see him come to the tri over. A good three and a half, four seconds to the It doesn't look like he's going to be a factor. I don't believe that he has enough time to, to make up that time, even though he might be running faster than any other car on the racetrack. So where would you want to be right now? Leading or second place? Your call. Sitting at home. Do you want to be running up with Darrell Waldron or sitting back there in that second place position at number 15, Earnhardt? And there's the man who's calling the shots. He wants his man, Darrell Waldron, right up in front. The legendary Junior Johnson. Hall of Fame member, winner of 50 Grand National Races. Certainly uh, has been a key figure in the sport of auto racing for many, many years. I'm sure he wants him up on the point. I don't, I don't think he wants him out back. And also looking on is Bud Moore. Many times decorated in World War II. Great battle hero. And the guy that has put together four cars that have raced and won countless times on every track on which the Grand National race. Including here at Talladega. Buddy Baker won three races in a row in his cars back in the uh, 76, 7, and 8 along in that period of time. Turn three. Two car shootouts are decided today here in the Talladega 500. Down they come out of turn four. Waltrip in front. Can he be the first man to ever win it back to back? I think Earnhardt is sitting there biding his time right now. We heard Cale Yarborough say when he fell out of the race that he felt that Earnhardt had the strongest car. He saw how well that car was handling in the draft. However, Bobby Allison can still play a big role in who wins this race. Even though he's not in contention for the win himself, if he so chooses, he could uh, be a factor in Dale Earnhardt moving around the Darrell Walton on the main track. Four seconds back to the leaders, number 27, Neil Bonner, and at least five seconds back in fourth position is Ricky. 
Mr. Teddy. That's the picture as we get down to it. The battle for six is 88 and 33. And that is Jeff Woodine and Mary Gant still at it. A little further back in the field. But the whole story rests right on the point. Right here. As Waltrip stays in front, Earnhardt keeps that forward in second place. The Chevrolet Ford shootout at Talladega 483. 185 complete this time. Earnhardt has made no attempt to move around there. Well, he's not about to give up his, uh, uh, any advantage that he thinks that he has at this time. He's not going to take his hand. There's Stevie Walker. That's Daryl White. Working on, she usually hands the scoreboard for them in the pits. And there is Dale Earnhardt's wife, Teresa. Well, she comes from a racing family, the Houston from Hickory, North Carolina. Her dad, Hal Houston, who uh, raced a number of years himself. Her, uh, of course, Tommy Houston. Oh, Tommy yeah. Houston still races uh, quite often. And of course, uh, they've uh, been very strong in sports auto racing for a number of years. Earnhardt content just to sit there and ride on Walter Bunn. 186 when they come by and two to go. Last two laps. Walter in first. Dale Earnhardt in second. Waltrip has won the national title the last two years. Earnhardt took the championship in 1980. Then things went bad for him. This year he seems to be having a little better luck at the midway point of the year. A great win at Nashville the other night with his car 15. Not the same car, their short car. Those big teams usually have as many as three cars. And now it's super speedway cars all slicked up aerodynamically just as perfect as they can make them. And it is the Junior Johnson car pulling away by three car lengths in turn three. But did Earnhardt let him do that? He might have dropped back so he could pick up that draft and see how he could pick back up on it very easily, and he did. Only the front two have a crack at it. Those other cars are all a lap or more now. The white flag is out. This is it. The last lap in Talladega is the typical Talladega last lap. Waltrip in first. Earnhardt leans back by about three car lengths. The place to make the move would be in turn number three. He comes out of two and squares it away. I think he'll make the move as he goes into turn three right now. He's heading down the back stretch. He makes his move, moves around Darrell Walker, bringing Bobby Allison with him. That's what he was hoping he would do. Allison would have an effect, an effect on the outcome of this race. So Allison pulls around. Now here comes Walker. He'll get one counter charge out of the tri-oval area. Walker will take one more shot. And here he comes. Allison dropping down, giving him room. He moves to the inside. There are lap cars there. Waltrip is coming up. They come up for the lap car, and the winner is Earnhardt. Fantastic racing. You see the crew, but more the crew, very happy there. There are the losers. And there are the winners. Dale Earnhardt has done it. He did it in style. A magnificent finish for Dale Earnhardt. He made his move properly. He brought Allison with him. And did you note that Allison moved down to give the second place man a fair chance of coming back? A lap car in the center. One through the inside, one the outside. And they went for it. They Very really went for it. Typical Talladega finish. A quick report from Mike Joy. Well, just as the checkered flag falls, so does the rain here at Talladega. But more, another typical Talladega finish. This one wouldn't be over until they drop the flag right at the wire. Well, yes, you know, it's a good win for us and a good win for Wrangler. And uh, we rocked Darrell. They, he drove such a heck of a good race, so I can't hardly talk about it. And uh, we're really proud. That's we two wins in the last three races. Yes, two wins in the last three races, and uh, we're proud that the good Lord held the rain off long enough for the checker flag. It's pouring right down now right here. We're on the way to victory lane. It's going to be a damp celebration, but an exuberant one for car number 15 and Dale Earnhardt's people. He led 11 times for 41 laps in that key lap, and let's look again at how he pulled it off. Take a look here, Ned, as, as they get car number 15 down and the crew celebrates a little. There he is in front. Allison got dragged through in the draft. I'm sure that Allison wanted to be up there. Well, yes, he did. And, you know, Ken, it, it did not surprise me to see Bobby Allison make that move because he's in a tremendous battle for Darrell Walter for the point lead. If Walter wins the race, that's an extra five points. And uh, here they come to the start-finish line as Walter moved on the inside trying to move back around using that car there as the draft trying to pick up a little extra speed but he just simply couldn't do it 
Well, we have another new face in Victory Lane today here at Talladega, Alabama, and it is Dale Earnhardt. What a remarkable finish for Earnhardt. And it looks as though things are going much better for Dale these days than they have for some time. Coming into this race, he was in 10th place in the standings. We're going to Victory Lane with Mike Joy in just a moment as they take Dale Earnhardt out of the car and he's taking a deep breath and just thinking about the fact that he's there. Well, he, he ran a, one of the smartest races that I've seen, as Bud Moore said. He ran a, a very, very good race. Sat there on the back bumper of Darrell Walker for his last seven or eight laps. Made his move when he needed to. Timing was absolutely perfect. What can you say? I mean, the man just did what he had to do. <laughs> he looks a little overwhelmed with the day and the effort. Well, he does. Of course, he'll wipe that uh, grease and grime and dirt. Let's go to Mike face. Joy. I've never seen anybody look so tired and yet so happy. I'm not tired. <laughs> that, was a, that was a mental strain right there. It was a real tough race. Uh, I like to thank Wrangler and Bud Moore and the whole crew. They, you know, they did a super job with the car, and it ran real super. I'd like to say hi to the kids at home watching on TV. Thank uh, Union, Winston, and all the people involved with Goodyear Tires. Everybody did a super job. Darrell Walker was one tough customer today. Though. Was the toughest part sitting behind him for those last few laps or trying to pass him? Well, he never had lead in, it, uh, in front and, uh, all day long, and I didn't know how much he had or where he'd be his toughest. And uh, luckily, I caught the draft this right and got by him. He tried to take us to the infield, but we got by him anyway. And uh, I think I pulled up Bobby back by him, and uh, that really helped us coming on through the trial. And then the slow traffic in front of us, I drafted off him through the trial, helped us get to it. But Darrell, you know, he did his best. I, I really, I wouldn't want to be in his position, I can tell you that. Let's find out about his position from Larry Newber. Well, the only man who has ever won this race twice, and I guess uh, a career is only as good as the last race, Darrell. And the last race you got second. I know you're disappointed. Well, it was, uh, I felt like I had an awful good chance to win this race. I knew Dale was uh, the guy there last two laps that's going to have to beat. And had I not had uh, interference, uh, I believe I could have done it. But I want to thank the good Lord for a safe race and, and tell everybody in Franklin and uh, up in Wilkesboro hello today. And, I'm proud of how the car run. I thought the boys did a good job, and we uh, almost won it. Darrell, that is a tough call. There was a lot of traffic involved with you and Dale in the last lap. Uh, would you have handled it differently had the rules been reversed? Had you been one of those lap cars? I don't know. It's hard to say. You know, you're going fast, and uh, it all comes down to what happens right through here. And uh, there was cars in the way, and Bobby was in the way. And uh, like I said, I'm just thankful I run second. I didn't have any problems today, and I run second. And that's enough to be thankful for. And what goes around comes around, as they say. <laughs> and the Super Speedway program. It was struggling a little bit early on, but you guys have really caught on with the program, I'd say, in the big tracks now. Well, it's really never been that bad. We just can't seem to find uh, being in the right spot at the right, like, the right time, like we were maybe last year. But these second places add up. Watch out. We're coming again. <laughs> and Squire, they're looking at uh, at least Darrell Walter Pope's right. the same type of late-season drive they've had the last two years in a row when they were champs. Come on, well, indeed they are, and the controversy continues to boil between Bobby Allison and Darrell Waltrip, as you heard from those comments there. We'll have more on this exciting finish at Talladega, Alabama, in just a moment. The Canadian Open is next today here on CBS, that exciting final round from Oakville, Ontario. And we've certainly had an exciting final round here at Daytona, and controversy is again beginning to boil out of this finish as Dale Earnhardt came to the line. The battle that has been going on for the last three years between Bobby Allison and Darrell Waltrip, we got a little taste of it there at the finish as Bobby Allison's car came down the inside and drafted through to finish, uh, started to finish a position in front. I think he dropped back as he came out of turn number four, but uh, it broke up the opportunity for Dale Earnhardt, or for Waltrip, to make another shot at Dale Earnhardt as they came down then. Yes, it did. When he moved on Earnhardt's bumpers, he started to round Darrell Waltrip. That gave Earnhardt the momentum that he needed to really shoot by in a hurry as we see them coming down to the uh, start-finish line here. Now, Waltrip is in the, trying to move back around Dale Earnhardt. You can see Allison's car had already dropped back out of the picture, but where he had come into the picture was 
that he helped Earnhardt to draft past Walter. Whether it was intentional or not, we don't know because of that rivalry. Of course, there's the uh, championship points at stake. The Allison crew has uh, locked the transporter. All that entire crew is over there around car number 22, and the crew is back in the transporter itself. Let's take a look at some of the statistics on today's race. It was a 170-mile-per-hour average by which uh, Dale Earnhardt won this race. There were 21 cars running at the finish from the 40 cars that started. Uh, we had 10 different leaders today and 45 lead changes, and Dale Earnhardt becomes the, well, it's still the 10th different winner of the season in as much as he'd also won at Nashville. I thought we might have broken a new record. That's, that's not true. And when it came down to a finish, the top two cars were there together, and the third finishing position today will be Neil Bonnet substituting for Tim Richmond with the fourth spot, Richard Petty, and finishing in fifth is Harry Gant. On a note about winning today, David Hobbs was successful in winning his third race of the year. A gentleman that's usually with us, Ned, he won at Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. He leads in the Trans Am point standings, and I guess he did a magnificent job from all reports. Let's go to Larry Newber quickly. Ned and Ken, we were going to follow up on the Bobby Allison story for you, but we've received a report that Bobby is over to the track hospital. Nothing serious. He had some debris that worked his way into his eyes, also like Tim Richmond's problem earlier in the day. He, along with crew chief Gary Nelson, are there attending to Bobby. So Bobby's okay, but uh, the car sits here with not a crew member around it. Well, let's take a look now at the top 10 from this Talladega 500, the 15th annual, no exception from the others, those typical great finishes. As we take a look at the top 10 here today, now you see Earnhardt winning, Waltrip second, Bonnet third, Petty fourth, and Harry Gant came home in fifth. Taking a look at the second five, Jeff Bodine winds up in sixth, Richard Brooks in seventh, Bill Elliott in eighth, Bobby Allison ninth, and Mark Martin finishes the day in 10th place. Earnhardt wins his first. Talladega 500, and he did it in style, coming out of turn number four. So that's the story today in the Talladega 500. This is Ken Squire for Ned Jarrett, Larry Newber, Mike Joy, saying so long from the 1983 Talladega 500. This CBS Sports Special has been sponsored by Budweiser. For all you do, this Bud's for you. Pontiac, who invites you to test drive a new Pontiac at your Pontiac dealer. At Pontiac, we build excitement. And by Sears Roebuck & Company. For quality merchandise, coast to coast, it's Sears. for final round coverage of the Canadian Open. The Talladega 500 has been a presentation of CBS Sports.